webinar is now live. Sergeants, can you start your recordings, please? <clears throat> Lisa, recording is up. Glad recording is started. Sergeant Bradley, can you give us the opening, please? Good morning and welcome to today's New York City Council Executive Budget Hearing on Finance, joint with Aging, Oversight and Investigations and Transportation. At this time, all panelists, please turn on your videos for ver verification purpose. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. Thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we may begin. Thank you very much. Good morning and welcome to the City Council's second day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2022. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on Aging, chaired by my colleague, Council Member Margaret Chin. I'm going to start by acknowledging my colleagues joining us, and they are uh, Council Member Grudenchik, Adams, Felice, uh, Minority Leader Matteo, Powers, Avery Samuels, Chin, and Reverend Diaz are here with us. Thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, the executive budget for the Department of Aging totals $440 million, up $56.5 million from its preliminary budget just three months ago, and includes $36.2 million in federal revenue received from President Biden's stimulus package. Significantly, this growth isn't just a temporary increase. It includes $49.4 million in new baseline funding to support several new needs championed by the council in our budget response. First, the executive budget includes $39.4 million for the first year of a five-year community care plan for older New Yorkers which creates 25 new senior known as NORCs. Second, the executive budget finally adds $10 million for the second phase of the senior center model budget, array, uh, which will increase rates to service providers and increase staffing and programming at senior centers. Initially, it was expected that senior center model budgeting would be fully funded by fiscal 21, but due to budget constraints because of COVID-19, it was delayed and will now be funded in fiscal 2022. Third, the executive budget increases support for the city's indirect cost rate initiative by $6.3 million for a $9.2 million total. This increase will also be retroactive to fiscal 2021, meaning that providers will receive 100% of their approved indirect funding for fiscal 21, rather than the expected cut of up to 70%. There are still a few important items that the council called for in the budget response that didn't make it into the executive budget and which we hope to see included in the adopted budget. For example, we sought $16.6 million to increase reimbursement rates for home delivered meals serve more seniors and add weekend meals. $6 million to expand case management and clear the home care wait lists. $4.9 million to address the growing need for mental health services by expanding the clinicians and senior centers initiative and the visiting program for homebound seniors programs. 4.4 million for 10,000 additional internet connected tablets to help more seniors bridge the digital divide and pay equity for human service workers. We are also very concerned by the executive budget's proposed 48% decrease since the preliminary budget in capital funding over the next four fiscal years. We look forward to working and continuing to work with DIFTA and the administration to ensure that these initiatives are prioritized. I wanna say thank you to Daniel Krupp Dohini Sampura, Noah Brick, uh, and Dohini and, and uh, Daniel are from the Finance Division for the preparations for today's hearings. 
I'll now turn it over to Chair Chin for her opening statement. Chair Chin. Thank you, Chair Drum. It's been a pleasure serving with you uh, for this past, this is our 12th year together. And this is our fourth, fourth budget together. And you as the Finance Committee Chair, and I'm really grateful for all your support. Good morning. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. And welcome Commissioner Cortez Vasquez from the Department for the Aging. In today's executive budget hearing, we will hear testimony from the Department for the Aging, also known as DIPTA, on its proposed $440 million budget for fiscal year 2022, which is $42 million greater than its fiscal 2021 budget. The executive budget adds 48 million for a community care plan that will create 25 new senior centers or NORCs. It also adds the long waited $10 million increase for senior center model budget and fully funds the indirect cost rate for providers with $6.3 million. During my time as chair of the Committee on Aging, DIFTA's budget has grown by 67%. We have moved from cutting services to adding them. I'm proud to say that in this budget, we have achieved a historic new investment in New York City's senior services. Congratulations to the commissioner, providers, advocates, and council members who have pushed relentlessly for this administration to do the right thing in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. Together, we are building critical new supports for this city's growing senior population. Federal revenues from the American Rescue Plan drive this expansion, and I thank our partners in Washington for their efforts as well. Despite these huge strides forward, we're not done yet. Providers are concerned about the short time frame for a new RFP for senior centers in Newark. I am concerned too, given that senior centers are hard at work preparing for their first grab and go meals in over a year, which begins on Monday. In addition, the executive budget still lacks the 16.6 million for the council's call for in, in his preliminary budget respond for home delivered meal, as well as 6 million for the case management, 4.9 million for mental health and 4.4 million for technology. We also need our one-time council and administrative funding restored. Commissioner, there's still time for DIPTA's budget to pass the half a billion dollar for the first time and create a senior service network that make New York the best city in the world to age it. So let's get it done this year to be truly the year of the seniors. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their hard work in preparing for this hearing. Uh, the senior final financial analyst, Daniel Krupp, uh, Unahead, Domini, Dohini Sopora, our committee counsel, Nusa Chidori, uh, finance, um, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, of course, our finance director, Latana McKinney and Regina Parita Ryan, and also my deputy chief of staff, Connor Irving and my legislative associate, Angela Seeger. Now I would like to uh, turn it back to our committee council who will review some procedural items relating to today's hearing before we swear in the commissioner. Thank you. Just before we go back to our committee council, I just wanna say thank you also, Chair Chin, for your very kind words. And it has been such a pleasure to work with you over these last 12 years. You are genuine and I really feel lucky to know you and to have worked with you. Uh, I've really enjoyed our tenure with you in the city council. So thank you, Chair Chin, for everything you've done. Yes, we can give her a round of applause. She's been <laughs> Thank you, Chair Drum. I also <laughs> want to thank you to Council Member Valone, who was my partner on this committee, who is still you know, my partner on this committee. And 
he's been such a strong advocate for our senior center. So I wanted to give a shout out to Council Member Vallone. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. And I have not had the pleasure to work with him for 12 years, but for the last eight years, I have had that pleasure. So thank you, Council Member Vallone. And I want to say you are here. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, also, we've been joined by Council Member Rose, Traeger, and Moya. And just, I have to read a statement just before we go to uh, Council. Uh, thank you, Chair Chin. We will now hear testimony from DIFTA Commissioner Lorraine Cortez Vasquez, who is also um, someone who I've known and had the pleasure to work with over many years now. So thank you, uh, Commissioner, for all that you've done for the city of New York and for the state of New York as well. Um, so she is joined by a Chief Operating Officer, uh, Michael Ognebeni, and Chief Financial Officer, Jose Mercado. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to our council to swear in the witnesses and council, thank you for all of your hard work as well. Thank you, Chair Drum. My name is Noah Brick and I'm counsel to the New York City Council Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you have been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. During this portion of today's hearing, we will hear testimony from the Department for the Aging. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and you will be called upon to speak. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I will now administer the affirmation to the administration witnesses. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Commissioner Cortez Vasquez? I do. Uh, Mr. Mr. Ognebene? I do. And Mr. Mercado? I do. Um, thank you. Commissioner, you may begin when ready. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, this is uh, quite a quite a day uh, that we've come to. It's the last hearing for many of us. It's the last executive budget hearing for many of us. So um, good morning, Chair Chin. Uh, good morning, Chair Drum. It's a, always a pleasure to work with you and to all the members of the Aging and Finance Committee. I'm Lorraine Colte Vasquez. I'm the commissioner of the New York City Department for the Aging. I'm joined this morning, as you just heard, by uh, Jose Mercado, who is the Chief Financial Officer, and Michael Ognebeni, our Chief Operating Officer. And I wanna thank you for this opportunity to discuss DIFTA's executive budget for fiscal year 2022. In addition to working to eliminate ageism and ensuring the dignity and quality of life of older New Yorkers, providing high quality services and resources are among the department's top priorities. To support this important work, our FY 2022 executive budget, as you both have said this morning, projects $439.9 million in funding, of which $285.6 million is uh, city funds, another uh, $230.3 million of those support older adult centers, which incorporates the $8 million in NORC funding. 41.8% uh, million, I mean, 48.8 million, I'm sorry, uh, of home delivered meals and 38 million for case management, another 34.4 million to support home care for homebound uh, seniors who are not Medicaid eligible, and 8.1 million for caregiver services. There is also an additional 6.2 million in indirect cost funding. In addition to supporting these services, the administration has invested heavily in responding to the continued pandemic. This administration has consistently made major investments in aging services. And I thank all of you who helped make that possible, including an overall increase of 100 uh, uh, pri the prior administration had taken $110 million away from aging services. In this executive budget, an additional $10 million, the long-awaited $10 million food model budget, 
uh, budget was included, fulfilling a promise to right size many contracts. Additionally, the $39.4 million for funding older adults and senior centers and no contracts to be allocated through the RFP. It is the largest investment in aging services in 20 years. It is the first time we've had an opportunity to expand in that same period of time. The FY22 uh, executive budget adds one 115 million, 115.4 million in coronavirus state and local recovery funds over three years. These funds are allocated to the community care investment that I just referred the indirect cost rate, which is extremely important, and the senior center model budget phase two. We are also incredibly grateful for the ongoing support of the city council, which in FY 2021 awarded DIFTA over $38.1 million in discretionary funding, allowing us to make every even greater investments in often underserved and unserved communities. We know that older adults overwhelmingly prefer to age in their homes and in their communities, if given the choice. To achieve these, many, needs, uh, many need a full range of high quality critical services, resources, and opportunities that will support them in their daily living activities. With this in mind, we have released a five-year community care plan, which promotes universal access to a continuum of service and supports in the community that will help prevent um, institutional care or nursing homes. With the current administration's investments, we have reversed losses and added slightly more from previous administrations. Additional investments are needed to help keep pace with the growth and the diversification and financial pressures facing older adults. Additionally, DIFTA aims to increase the diversity in its portfolio of providers to address historic funding inequities. We know that roughly half of the older adults use centers in their districts, while another half travel to other centers. We hope to tap into the technologies that have come online in recent years and that have reached isolated older people, connect people with their communities and help ad address a variety of pressing needs. A critical next step in this plan is to reimagine older adult centers, OACs as we're calling them now, always loved and revered and called senior centers, and naturally occurring retirement communities to promote collaboration, innovation, and synergy between these two core DIFTA programs. It is to be accomplished through the current request for proposal. To start to achieve these goals, the budget includes 39.4 million to fund an additional 25 uh, older adult centers or NORCs and to support and ensure full utilization. This includes better marketing outreach to inform the community of the rich array of community care services available to them. It also encompasses expanded transportation to reach those who are geographically isolated and live in transportation deserts, which we will be able to fund this also in FY23. This executive budget also includes the $10 million of the non-food model budget funding, which focuses on programming and programming staff. As you may recall, the model budget exercise aimed to achieve two goals. One was to increase revenues and ensure strong programming in our network of congregate centers and the second was to make more uniform funding levels of each center to support equity and staffing structures and salary. In FY18, the first phase of this process began and it focused on programming and program staff and resulted in a significant investment of $10 million of baseline funding to our network of older adult centers. This allowed centers to right size salary hire more staff and expand and enrich center programming. We appreciate the council's continued advocacy for these funds and the mayor's commitment to them. As you know, the council, the mayor and service providers have been working collaboratively to address indirect costs. 
These are a portion of provider costs that are not directly attributable to service delivery, but are necessary for operations like accounting, human services, fundraising, rent, general operations, and other eligible costs. DIFTA contracts will all will receive two, uh, $6.2 million in funding to cover these indirect costs. And I'm gonna, um, this is an important feature, especially for the smaller nonprofits uh, and it supports their op administrative operations. This funding will help uh, stabilize contracts for social service providers across the city. You know that many older adults lack access to technology, which has been a lifeline, especially during this pandemic. We recognize the value and the importance of virtual programs. In addition to the device itself, reliable internet and digital literacy training are fundamental components of access. As you know, last summer through a program led by the Mayor's Office of Chief Technology, with the support of the New York City Housing Authority and DIFTA, the city delivered 10,000 free Wi-Fi equipped tablets to older NYCHA residents. The program included one year of uh, free internet which helps, uh, which was set to expire this month. But we're thrilled that the city has extended the free Wi-Fi along with the contract to the older adults technology services, which we all know as OATS, to continue to provide training, education and technology support. We have continued to invest in planning for increased access and support in this area. This is a fundamental component of our community cares plan as well. And we continue to explore ways, not only to ensure access, but also to innovate our use of technology to make access to other services easier. The pandemic has put a strain on all of us. That is an understatement, especially older adults who are most vulnerable and isolated. Since the start of the pandemic, we have increased supports to address isolation. In March, 2020, we started with wellness calls to older adults in all our programs. And to date, we have conducted over 4 million calls. These serve an essential purpose, not only to check in on the older adults to reduce isolation, but also to provide referrals to other services like food and security, friendly visiting, elder abuse, mental health, and other services. In addition to DIFTA's geriatric mental health programs, Friendly Visiting is also, has also served as a mental health intervention program. It focuses on isolation, largely homebound seniors who are connected with DIFTA's contract management, uh, case management agencies. The program matches older adults facing the negative effects of social isolation with well-trained match volunteers who spend time with them to provide social interaction. The program expands the older adults connection to their community and helps prevent the isolated older adult from declining into depression and loneliness. During the last years, these visits have continued and have been uh, continued uh, virtually as well as telephonically. To expand services and to uh, support the uh, social isolation and loneliness of a broader range of older adults, DIFTA also launched a program called Friendly Voices in October 2020. This program was established to open eligibility to a wider range of older adults and will remain virtual. Friendly Voices offers older adults the opportunity to be matched to a volunteer, a peer, or a small group. And the Friendly Voices program currently has openings for older adults to join. To sign up as a volunteer or an older adult, individuals can call our Aging Connect program, which is an entree to all aging services. And the number there is 212-244-6469. I am proud of DIFTA's most recent uh, ad campaign, which was an anti-ageism campaign, Ageless New York, which focuses on the pervasive thoughts and attitudes New York have on aging and older adults and the negative impact that ageism has on personal lives, self-esteem, the workplace, the health industry, and our economy. The campaign highlights old, real older New Yorkers who are active and defy the stereotypes about older adults. The messaging focuses not only on aging, 
uh, and not stopping individuals uniqueness gives the contribution it highlights those the anti-ageism campaign consists of both visual and um, visual and video psas which are running on bus shelters linked nyc boards facebook and google ads and a web and a website nyc.gov backslash ageless new york and nyc media assets including nyc tv and New York City taxi monitors. Our hope is that as more people get information about ageism, those of us who are older will not be affected by these insidious attitudes uh, that we experience regularly. The COVID pandemic has challenged us. Oh, the other thing I wanna say is that ageism is insidious. We all do it in, in uh, sometimes unbeknownst to ourselves. And so the campaign also challenges individuals to look at their own attitudes of ageism. The COVID camp, uh, pandemic has challenged us to do more with our limited resources while underscoring the critical importance of community care. On the one hand, concentrating all the older the persons in institution has been a tragic driver of death tolls in this pandemic. It also resulted in the detrimental mental health effects to the many isolated uh, isolation uh, unnecessarily imposed upon nursing home residents during this time and to their families. Those isolated at home have feared, have feared far better in terms of physical health. It has been much easier to avoid the worst effects of isolation within, within home-based settings, which has allowed continuing connections one by one in family households and via community care professionals. The community player care plan will achieve the city's long-term vision of providing universal access to appropriate high quality community care services and supports the growing older multicultural population. This included a continued investment in virtual programming, as well as the support of older adults accessing a device connectivity, technology and literacy tra uh, training. Additionally, continue strategic investments to expand case management, home care services, caregiver services, and other essential services, including referral to services such as mental health programming. More older adults will have the option to age in place. We look forward to advancing these goals with you this year and in the next four years of the plan. I continue to be proud of the work that DIFTA has done I am proud of the incredible talented staff that DIFTA has assembled and look forward to an influx of additional resources and investments in the years to come towards the community care plan. As also, we are grateful to the chairs and the committees for your advocacy and continued partnership to support older New Yorkers. And I thank you for that. Thank you very, thank you very much, Commissioner. Before we go to questions, I'd just like to announce that we've been joined by council members Ayala and Brooks Powers. And uh, let me start off with some questions um, regarding um, the planning for COVID-19 uh, recovery. So I wanna credit the administration for heeding the council's call in fiscal 22 preliminary budget response to enhance support for the city's 1.6 million seniors with its $47.6 million baseline investment to create 25 new senior centers in NORCs and the price $10 million for model budgeting. Uh, so when can we expect to see all of the 25 new senior centers or NORCs opened? We, the, the goal is, and it's an, an ambitious goal because we would like to make sure that that happens this year so that the investment could be realized. And the goal is to start those programs October 1st. Uh, the RFP is, is currently on, in, the, in the field. Um, we have, in addition to releasing the RFP over two weeks ago, we have a robust uh, addendum which addresses all of the questions raised during the bidders conference and the uh, RFP. So we expect the programs to start October 1st. Commissioner, I've heard some concern from senior centers and advocates 
about uh, the deadline on the um, RFP. Um, on, I think it's May 27th, if I'm not mistaken. Um, is there a possibility that that deadline can be extended? Well, I'm proud to tell you, and I, so, I said this with uh, to Chairwoman Chin last night, that uh, yes, the deadline has been extended. We've also sh I heard those concerns and the deadline has been extended to June 10th. And okay. so now there is an additional two weeks. So there is a, a total of close to nine weeks to address the RFP. Okay, thank you. That's great news. Yeah, um, thank you. Yeah, is there a model budget for these new centers in Norks? The model budget process that we've employed in the past will also be the model budget process that we're looking at as part of the RFP. Okay, thank you. Um, and will the $47.6 million support the 1.3 million for nurses at Norks? Uh, the city council has added in the past two years. Um, I believe it's in it's a part of the RFP process, but I'm going to turn to uh, Jose Mercado, the chief financial officer, who has the details on the specific details on the uh, budget on, the, on each is, category. Jose, yeah, yeah, that is correct. That information that those funds are a part of the current RFP. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, and let me can just I, make. Can I just add one thing sure. to that? The other, the one of the other things that we've done in the RFP is also encourage, if you weren't a NORP but were a senior center, that that was also a service that we would like to see as an enhancement. All right. Okay. So I just, I'm sorry about that. Yes, and just um, I, one of the concerns that I have is the last time that the uh, NORPs uh, went out for uh, that the RFP went out for NORPs. Um, three centers were left out, one in my district, one in former council speaker, Melissa Marcus Riverito's district, and one in Southern Queens. Mine is a uh, self-help and the Southern Queens is JASA and the other one may have been JASA as well. Is there any assurance that those NORCs um, will not be cut out? They weren't cut out because they, they didn't qualify. They qualified, but there was not enough funding. So I, I and, and, and Jose will correct me if I'm overstating, uh, but my understanding is that we have uh, normalized uh, that and, and uh, put, included those in the RFP so that they do not find themselves year by year, um, as, you know, as, as you've just well said, you know, we funded them every year, we've had to do that as a special add-on. And, uh, but all of that has been included as part of the RFP. Is that accurate, Jose? Yeah, I'm just going to add as well as the RFP actually has three competitions. There's one strictly you can bid for NARCs by themselves, right? You can bid strictly for seniors, uh, older adult centers by themselves, and then you can also bid for two combined. So we actually have three pots of money. So anyone can compete for all three of those. So from our perspective, we have, for example, for the NARCs, we have a baseline of 23 million. That's what we're assuming that's the base, the minimum for 23. And on top of that, we can increase more and more. That's part of the 25. So from that perspective, there is a separate competition just for NARCs. Okay, and I'd like to know if we can continue the discussion uh, into the um, adopted budget um, so that we know whether or not um, those NORCs in particular will be funded um, so that if not, because the council has also been putting in funding for those NORCs uh, and, and that we can figure out what we're going to do so that none of them are cut out. Yeah, so, so the, you know, obviously this is all about getting the RFPs, looking at who's the bidders, reviewing it. So we will have a much better sense um, by October, um, I'm sorry, by uh, June 10th, the number of prospects that have come in and have some sense of where we are. All right, a better okay. sense. And then also concerning the uh, dissenters and the NORPs, uh, what about um, things such as case management, mental health counseling and new technology? Will that be included in the uh, new NORCs and centers? The expansion of those services, and Jose and Michael, you can uh, add to my comments. The expansion of those services was planned for the second year, all right? So the expansion of home care and the case management is planned for the second year. What we needed to do in this first year was expand the base services, which are NORCs and senior centers. And uh, looking at, because this is a five-year plan, that other expansion would occur in the second year of funding. 
So we, we're not gonna see a reduction in the wait list for um, case management? Different conversation. Okay. <laughs> a different conversation. Um, but um, we have, you know, as you know, we have seen a, a wait list of, and it increased incrementally uh, during the pandemic. But what we've also seen as the pandemic has gone down, we have seen a 46% reduction in the case management wait list. And I also want to add, you know, in anticipation of the question on home delivered meals, there, you know, we immediately, uh, as we assess someone if, uh, and identify the emergency needs and food insecurity is one of the emergency needs, needs, we then rely on get food during this pandemic period to, um, to absorb that individual until they get normalized into a home delivered meals program. And again, in anticipation of the follow-up question, it's that we've been able to increase home delivered meals. And because we've used the CARES, the emergency CARES money, we know that we can continue that increase for the next year into the next budget year that increased demand on home delivered meals. Um, so okay, gonna, is that sorry. accurate? Yeah. I just want to, yeah, I just want to clarify something. So there will be, for example, the commissioner has been working with OMB to expand technology for the senior centers, and she's correct. That will be happening in fiscal year 22. Regarding case management, there is no money in the current budget for expansions, I'm right. sure, for case management as is. So um, the executive budget didn't include any additional funding, just to go to the, the home meals that you're, that you're re referencing. It didn't include any uh, additional funding for home delivered meals. Am I correct on that? That is, that is correct. But as the commissioner mentioned, we've been using stimulus money to continue to cover the, our current growing need in home delivered meals. Uh, and I'm going to add more to this as well. We're still, for example, working, waiting for the state to also give us our appropriation for additional stimulus money. For, so there is more money coming for that for meals, for meal insecurity in general. So when you say the state, are you, um, uh, is it, does that include money from the feds that goes through the state or do yeah. you get money from the feds directly? No, that is, that is the former. That is correct. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, and since April 2020, the city has been issuing uh, Get Food, has been using Get Food New York City budgeted in the Department of Sanitation as the overflow plan for seniors with emergency food needs that can't be met within DIFTA's own home delivered meals program. Given that there are thousands of seniors who've been placed on get food due to capacity issues, is DIFTA working with OMB to get additional funding into its home delivered meals program? And I'm gonna address that and Jose, you'll correct the details if I'm overstating again. Uh, I'm not overstating, but if, I, if I've left anything out. The, um, the, we have used the stimulus money to increase the home delivered meal capacity and home delivered meals programs. And the goal is to continue that as we go forward. You know, as you know, we have identified somewhere, anywhere between, depending on the day, between 25 and 100,000 older adults who were not participating in the services, who raised their hands for, for services, primarily right. food services. And that is, those are the people that we are you know, normalizing if they choose to go on to the home delivered meal program. Okay, and then in regard to the home delivered meal, the Get Food program, um, uh, the quality of the food oftentimes is not culturally competent. Um, is, what type of effort is being made to ensure that those meals are, are culturally competent? I would, I would defer those questions for Get Food to Get Food. I can tell you that we've been in close partnership with Get Food and have shared with them our nutritional standards, have also shared with them, you know, uh, many of the uh, culturally competent uh, contractors. And I believe that they have made some efforts in that, in that arena, but I would defer those questions to get food. Okay, and commissioner, just to make you aware, as you may already know, um, from my community in particular, um, you know, oftentimes they'll get lima beans, but they're not the type of lima beans that, you know, a certain group of people are accustomed to, or even the same thing with rice, et cetera. So they get rice, but it's not the rice that they like to use. So, so I, I, the, I am pleased to announce, as, as Chairwoman Chin said in her opening remarks, and I believe you did also, that we're resuming a grab and go process uh, where the food will come 
back from their own senior center that they know and they're familiar with. And that mm -hmm. process is starting uh, pretty soon. I mean, it's up to the provider when they can and, and are um, when, and they choose to start grab and go. But we have with, with, with the chairwoman's constant advocacy uh, and partnership, we've been pushing for grab and go and we're, we're at that point now. And so we're glad that we're able to do that transition as the first pathway to reopening. And we're very well aware of the uh, chair's uh, constant advocacy, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> uh, all right, let me just finish up with this and then I'll turn it over to Chair Chin. There are currently $38.1 million, this, there is a $38.1 million deficit resulting from the absence of council uh, seniors initiatives and administration one-time additions for senior programs like NORCs, which I mentioned before, NYCHA clubs and senior centers. By not baselining these programs in the fiscal 22 executive budget, the administration runs the risk of funding cuts to these essential programs. So um, why are you not funding those programs and uh, or baselining those programs? Um, maybe you answered it a bit when I was talking to you about the NORCs. Um, can you just elaborate further on that for me, please? Jose, can you repeat how we've baselined all of it into the RFP? Oh, it's into, okay. So no, so, so I'm gonna make a distinction. There are the discretionary money that you guys fund every year. And then there are agreements that we've made in a couple of years where we were funding them, funding those specific programs and we baseline those. So those are kind of, there are two different pots of money we're talking about. There are the ones that we fund, right? Which we made the agreements in the past and those are part of the RFP. The 38 million that you fund are not part of the RFP. Those again, are we're hoping that with your generous, you know, advocacy that these things will continue going as well. But I also want to, I want to underscore Chairman Chin, I mean, Chairman Drum, uh, one of the first commitments you mm -hmm. made me, you asked me for uh, when I became commissioner was to put a, lots of attention on the 10 ethnic nonprofits that, and, uh, uh, that you funded with discretionary funds. We have put a lot of effort into those and ensure that this RFP is responsive to their needs so that they are not left out. Because the concern was, can they compete and be considered? Right. And we've done everything that we can in this RFP to ensure that they are not um, put anything that serves as a disadvantage to them. So, yes, and I know that you visited uh, the Queen Center for Gay, Gay Seniors. Are they included in that? Um, as well, you mentioned ethnic, but not the LGBT is included as well. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm going to One of my over. favorite places. Go ahead. I know. I know. You've been there. I know. <laughs> uh, it's right around the block from me, so it's important. Um, Chair Chin. Thank you, Chair Drum, Commissioner. Um, I'm glad to hear that you have extended um, the deadline for the RFP, uh, two weeks, but I really ask you to consider longer than two weeks because uh, providers have told me that they got this huge addendum back um, and then also for them to make sure that they can really be competitive. So I, I still ask you to consider a little bit longer, um, more than two weeks. Chairman, um, Chairwoman Chen, you know that I listen to, but I also we also have this this competing deadline, which is the October first uh, implementation. So yes, I'm listening to that, and as we get more information, then we can make an informed decision. But okay, I'm committed, I'm committed to continuing that discussion with you. Great, thank you. Um, okay, my question is uh, well, the fir first question is on the model budget. Uh, I know that we finally got uh, the 10 million put in. Uh, I wanted you to maybe elaborate a little bit more on how that money um, is going to be spent. Because on the first time, with the first 10 million, there were centers that did not get a dime. And like these were centers that were serving a large um, senior population. And the council that we have to step in and continue uh, to provide supplemental money uh, for their essential services. So can you just elaborate more like to make sure that this extra funding will go to every senior center because 
there's great need and we're still, we're still uh, supplementing them. Right. So what I can tell you is that there was a formula that we, de we designed um, with you. Um, and one of the things that uh, goes to normalizing and right sizing programming and staff. And so what we're looking at is to, and we look at those programs that have the lowest number of staff and the lowest number of programs. And so we're looking at it very, very carefully to make sure that it is incorporated into those programs so that we can right size them because that's what it was. It was a model budget process. Um, and Jose, if you want to elaborate how we're looking at that, I would appreciate it. Yeah, no, so I would say, I would basically echo what the commissioner said. It was based on a specific formula. We were looking at specific salaries to make sure that there was a minimum amount for each agency. But if there are specific agencies that you have concerns with, if you can forward to us and we can look at this um, and get back to you on this. Well, I mean, we talked about it with the last model budget that came out. I mean, there are yeah. eight, uh, there are agencies that actually, when you're just talking about staffing, uh, they have greater need because of the population they serve. They need more bilingual, bicultural staff, and you know all the extra costs that was not covered. But we we hope to have this you know continual conversation, to make sure that every center you know get their fair share. Um, yes. That we that, and the council that commitment is there. Right. And then we the council are not providing money for core services. I think that is a, a key issue. Just, yeah, we understand that. But again, the, the premise behind the model budget was to make sure there were at least minimal salaries across the board. Some agencies had top salaries much higher than the minimum. And I think that's kind of where the model fell um, in that piece. Again, we can have conversations about, like the commissioner said, we can come back and look at this again. Um, given the fact that this actually will be implemented, again, ends part of the July one. So, and then that's like the first three months of that first quarter because we can kind of look at this again. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to talking about senior center reopening. I mean, we're very happy to hear that grab and go will start on Monday, um, May 10th. But some of the providers was a uh, one week notice. Uh, so that's- No, 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 that? no, no, I want to be clear. We said they could give us information and they can start as soon as they can. We didn't, we, we don't have a mandated date when they start. They'll let us know when they are able and want to start, all right? But said there's some we, uh, go. my understanding, and then I think from the notice that was sent out that May 10th is the first day that they can start the grab and go. May 12th was, by May 12th, they had to give us information and they can start as early as May 10th if, they, if they're if they ready. All of this is, it was a voluntary process. It's not a mandated opening date. So how many, how many centers do you know is ready to start on May 10th? I'll get back to you on that. I don't have that information right now. But there are centers that are ready to go, right? I, I believe some seniors so. are expecting to grab and go on May 10th. <laughs> I, but that's that was never that was never a definitive date. I will I will get back to you on that. And uh, we can we can look at see who is ready for May 10th, who's ready for May 15th, who's ready. We can give you that that uh, rolling deadline that they're giving, I mean, the rolling opening date that they, they're providing, all right? So I yeah, can, I, I mean. Can give, I can give a little more clarity. So there was a document that was sent out that basically asked the providers to submit whether they can opt in, you know, put in your, whether you want to opt in, please let us know by May 12th. We did give the option, as the commissioner said, is that if you can start earlier, let us know. We do have a couple of people, a couple of programs who are very eager to start on Monday. I think that's where the confusion is. We did not say start Monday, but we do have a couple who are very eager. We're looking at their financials to make sure that they're valuable to start on Monday. Well, this providers definitely will need the support, the resources and the support to help right. them um, right. get started. And we wanna make sure they have that, they have that information. And the other right. thing is that the city is opening up. I mean, restaurants, um, a lot, you know, increase the capacity, there's outdoor dining. So there are a lot of ways that the seniors can go back to their center uh, to get services, not just the grab and go. I mean, that's a good be skinning, but what about, you know, getting some social service support or mental health support, one-on-one -on -one, um, counseling discussion. I mean, though all those services should be available. I mean, that's what seniors are asking. The restaurant 
down the block is open. How come my center down the block is not open? Uh, and it is such a critical need for them uh, to be back with their friends, the isolation that they have endured for the whole past year. And, and that's what we've been you know, advocated for um, to get them to reopen um, as quickly as possible. So we wanna make sure that they get the resources and support they need from DIFTA so they can so do I, that. Yeah, thank you for that. And of course they will. And what we've done also is worked, and as you, you're well aware of this, we've worked very closely with the Department of Health and they've given us some guidelines for reopening in the event that we can start congregate. And so we'll be sharing those. Um, and they've also given us very good guidelines on low, um, what, what, they're, what we're all calling outdoor low risk activities, grab and go being the first of those. And so those guidelines have been prepared. We just need to put them through the administrative process, you know, meaning city hall and, and the law department, but um, they're there when we are ready to open. So people will be prepared as to what is gonna be required uh, for an opening. So all of that preliminary planning has been put in place. So when do you expect, uh, anticipate? Because the mayor's talking about July 1st, the city will, and so all the senior centers gonna be ready by July 1st? Chairwoman Chin, you and I both share that desire to open senior centers. <laughs> I and I and I always defer. This pandemic has been the most eye-opening, mind-boggling disease that we've ever experienced. And we have and I and I defer to the science. And when when the scientists and the medical community says that it is safe for congregate activities and for activities other than outdoor low-risk activities we will be the first there with you in reopening. But I, I have to defer and respect the science and follow the science. Well, I mean, we will we'll continue to advocate um, to push because the providers have been provide, you know, doing all the support work with the grab and go, I mean, with the get food and they were asked to be the one to help register the seniors and same thing with registering uh, seniors for vaccine, if they were having problem doing it online, you and I made robocalls and say, call your center. So we got to provide the support so that seniors yeah, the, the, can the back. Thing, yeah, and we, and we do, and we, and we have, and uh, we could, we'll continue to do that. Um, what I want to say is that as part of grab and go, just precisely on this vaccine, uh, vaccination question, one of the things that we've built in is to get information as to who might not be vaccinated in a senior center and get that information to the Department of Health as well as getting them information so that we could ensure that as many older adults as possible are vaccinated because that also helps the pathway to reopening. And so that's gonna be part of the grab and go uh, approach. And we're very proud of that. Okay. On, the, on your community uh, care plan and, and the RFP, there was no concept, I mean, there was a concept paper that was issued for um, the older adult center, senior center, but there was no concept paper for the NORC. So how much of the $230 million in the RFP are going to the NORC program? And, and um, why was there not a need for a concept paper for the North? The reason, the reason, uh, my understanding from the procurement policy um, requirements is that there is not a need for a concept paper. I've always believed in a concept paper if there was going to be a material difference in the operation of a program, which is why we've done that with the senior center. And we did that over a year ago, we started having conversations and planning groups and input from the network and task forces that we've assembled so that we could inform that concept paper and then inform the RFP. In the NORC program, in the program structure and design, there was no material difference and therefore a concept paper was not necessary. Well, I know that the, the council, we 
put in the 1.3 million for nursing services for North. Is that going to be included in the RFP part of money? Because that's a core service. That's Jose true. didn't. Jose yes. said that that was baseline. Jose, can you address that? So, so I mean, so for example, that's part of the discretionary pot, correct? Right. Yeah. So that is not. That is not. That is not. But that should be in there. I mean, it's only discretionary because we right. had to put it in because it's a right. it's a need servant. But it's a I core understand. service that should be part of. Um, the NORC program, right? Yeah, I understand that. But I'm just saying is, for example, what we ask for is we need included specific information. Now, for example, as mentioned earlier, as you discussed, as we mentioned earlier, there are three competitions. One is the NORC itself. We have a minimum right now of $8 million set aside for NORC. On top of that, there's another seven that can also be added to that NORC competition. Again, we've asked all providers to come in with, you know, with their requests, and this could be part of their request, and it could be part of the RFP as well. So, but did you specifically mention that it could be part of the RFP? We opened, like, um, I can get back to in terms of the details, but I do know, for example, any, any provider could submit a request in terms of what they right. want for this program to look like. So we didn't put any kind of limit on what the programming should look like. We all kind of left it flexible so they can put in all their needs for the program, as well as the funding needs as well as the programmatic needs. Okay. I mean, I just want to make sure that it is part of the core program so that the council don't have to put in the money um, for nursing service that kind of was so critical because we had to do it, but it should be part of the, the RFP. Um, the other issue is- um, And I'm glad, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's gonna be an important part of our review then. Mm -hmm. And then we will, we will look at that very, very, very closely, all right? In terms of technology, um, and one of our past hearings, we talked about, you know, the stimulus money that was coming in to provide uh, emergency broadband benefits. So is DIFTA helping seniors sign up for that program? We because have, the program will end when the funds run out. Are you talking about the bill that just, are you talking about the bill that just went into effect? No, this was the, December 2020 stimulus money. It was talking about emergency broadband benefit that was included in that. That program allows seniors and other on low income uh, to receive a monthly discount off the cost of uh, broadband services. We mentioned, we talked about it in, uh, in the past hearing with um, technology committee, because seniors definitely could qualify for that. I'll have to get back to you on that because I'll tell you what we are doing in technology and maybe that addresses it, but I, I, I want to be specific to your, answer your question specifically, all right? Mm -hmm. um, what we have done in um, the, um, it, the broadband technology um, is still not in place. The FCC has not rolled out the guidelines, all right? Uh, so it needs to roll out its guidelines and then we could follow those. That is my understanding. But what we have done so far is um, for, uh, or have been in conversations with OMB about expanding the NYCHA program so that we can have um, more technology and tablets available for other than NYCHA residents. And what mm -hmm. we've also done is we've started some conversations with some cable providers to see how we could work with them and senior centers and come up with a plan where they can have low cost uh, services, uh, particularly to support the work that we've been doing virtually. Um, mm -hmm. And so those are conversations going on, but until the FCC rolls out its guidance, um, it is difficult for us to do education and advocacy in that arena. Although we did have conversations with the CTO and how are we gonna start doing that? But it's not in place yet. Okay. Um, my last question and then I'll, I'll turn it over um, to my other colleagues and mental health services. Um, I was very excited when I heard the mayor talk about uh, providing social workers to every schools for our 
for our kids, for our young people. So I want the same thing for my, our seniors, for our older adults. Are we going to be able to have, you know, mental services support uh, in every senior center, in every North program? Uh, so how do we get to that point where, because the senior were definitely traumatized through the pandemic, through all the, you know, isolation, they couldn't talk, meet with their friends, couldn't meet with their family. I mean, they definitely need the service. So how are we fighting for that in terms of new needs that to make sure that every center, every NORC have this mental health support, just like our schools. Yeah, that well, the stimulus money, which we thought we could benefit from was really directed towards education. And so it, but we have been in, 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 in wonderful conversations, productive conversations with Thrive as well as with OMB around this issue. And we're also supporting a Thrive's uh, grant to a federal grant to the National uh, Institute of Health precisely for geriatric mental health centers. So it is not something that we've expanded. Uh, we've more than doubled the number of geriatric mental health uh, uh, services and then we've also more than doubled because we did that whole uh, hub and spoke model that we introduced last year. We hope that we could be able to do that, which is a cost effective model and provide services for all. But at this point, uh, we're in conversations about how can we then expand those services with both uh, OMB as well as with Thrive. Well, I hope that you know before we adopt the budget that we hear some good news on that. Because I think that it's great that you know the administration is providing the services to all our young people, the, the students, but they definitely cannot forget the seniors. So we will continue to to advocate for that. Yes, Commissioner, I I want to make sure that our budget go beyond at least half a billion, so <laughs> that we can say that the budget is more than half a percent of yeah. the city's budget. <laughs> That's our goal, okay? Let's, That's let's our goal. get over that half a billion line. Billion, half a billion, half a billion. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna pass it on uh, to our uh, committee councils to call on other uh, Thank you council again. member. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Shen. If any council members have questions for DIFTA, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including answers. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to tell you when your time begins. The Sergeant will then let you know when your time is up. We will now hear from Council Member Vallone, followed by Council Member Dharma Diaz. Thank Start you, in Mike. time. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Mighty Margaret and Danny Drum. Uh, yes, and I have to echo the same sentiments. It has been an amazing eight year journey fighting side by side for our seniors and for all New Yorkers. But truly a privilege, Margaret, for all that we've done over the last eight years and Danny fighting on the budget to make sure those, those dreams become realities. So much of the services for seniors came through on the council side when things weren't picked up. Um, and to see a budget this year, Commissioner, where we have that additional funding coming in, I think we're really ending on a positive, good note on, on seeing the changes and the prioritization of seniors um, is what we've always, always said. As the highest demographic in the city and growing in the number one area, uh, we always have to reflect that. So that's a good win. Uh, so thank you for that. I wish I had the 12 years, Margaret, with you and Danny, but we were always stuck with eight. So I would have loved another four. Um, you know, can we clear up maybe some light Commissioner, on the, the wonderful community care plan and the 48 million, do you have any, I guess, estimates on, on where those are going to be at this point and how that process is going to be worked, how they're going to be spread out over the city and will there be involvement on, yes, on from uh, providers and communities? Sure, Councilman Vallone, and I'd be more than happy to show you. I don't have it with me, and even if I did, I wouldn't know how to do a share screen. So... I don't have it with me, but I'll be more than happy to share the map with you. But what we've done is we looked at where existing senior centers are, right? And then we also looked at where growth has occurred. 
And we also looked at where we have had what we have considered, and I think I've spoken to this at a, at a previous hearing, where we saw service deserts, all right? And then service deserts coupled with transportation deserts became the highest need. Well, then we check all the boxes. Uh, exactly. <laughs> we so, check all those so boxes I, out. No, and, I, and I wish I were better prepared to tell you exactly what we're doing in your districts, but I can tell you that you do, there's a, I don't know if it's your district in particular, but Queens does check a lot of those boxes. But yeah. it's where the great, where the greatest growth is, it's where the greatest diversity has occurred, because we're looking at a variety of factors in our community assessment need. But there is a map, I can share it with you, and it shows you where the uh, anticipated areas are for new norks and, and senior centers. But that's good. We, we'd love to be part of that and just to see what the initial vision is and maybe how we can enhance or, or work with you to show you some of those areas. I mean, each council member is always going to advocate for their districts. We, we are all of those things that you mentioned in, in Northeast Queens, highest population of seniors, furthest away from all services, no transportation options. So it's, it's critical uh, to, to see that those plans are going into place. Is there any talk of maybe just like we do with schools, if we don't find a new senior center, maybe expanding or working with the providers to do of extension course. of the existing at the right, because some of them are Absolutely, are that, is, that, that is the beauty of this RFP. This RFP is really revisioning, all right? We did a community assessment needs. And as Jose so aptly said before, people have the opportunity to either create a new NORC create a, a senior center based on the needs and or expand existing or collapse, uh, you know, collapse in our uh, NORC as well as an older adult. So that those, that's what we're hoping to see in the, in the submissions to this RFP. That is what is possible uh, here. There is a- And that might be the, that might be the area instead of creating a whole new uh, vision plan. There are, there are centers that we are all aware of who have room for expansion or need some additional uh, uh, services like doing the, the wiring and the electrical just to expand the community room and bring in some virtual set uh, needs to the existing centers that we may be able to do even if we don't target a new center. So that's good to hear that we can help. And there, and there also is the possibility that they can have cooperative agreements with each other. Perfect. You that's, provide the, the case management, I'll provide the arts program. You, you know, that's the, what we're trying to do is to have continuum of care in a community and those kind of uh, collaborations. You know, we've been stuck in a model for more than 25 years, you know, that had not changed. Um, and we hadn't issued an RFP in more than 10 years. This is a, an opportunity to address this growth, this diversity and this total demographic change that we've had not only in the city, but in the older population. And that's why this community care plan and, is so- And I want to- I'm expired. Well, if I could just finish that. I want to applaud you and your team. After the last hearing, you did reach out on some of the questions we had, and you did work directly with the providers who were asking the questions. And that was uh, a big help to see that, you know, the team's listening. And same thing here. We'd love to work with you. I, I know immediately of two or three areas that were either in the middle of an expansion, planning expansion, and the pandemic hit, funding stopped, and, and if they can access those funds to finish off those growth in the existing, that would be a huge win for the we'll seniors. Send you, we'll send you the map and you start working at the local level. I can no longer talk to individuals about the RFP because the RFP is out, but I no, will I, send you the map and you can do all of the discussions that you can do. I know Chair Chin tried to, to ask, but I have to ask because I, I, that is the number one, or not number one now, whereas I get my, my vaccination shot. But after that, when they will be opening, um, I, you know you said you relied on the science, but I can't tell that to folks when they're calling my office because in today's, today's news, that comes out faster than, than everything. Everything seems to be opening. What, I, what I'd like to hear is maybe that we can provide a date even on a limited capacity, we, we have to eventually start to the point of saying we're opening July 1st with a percentage of capacity, and then we're gonna work with the seniors that are vaccinated, not vaccinated, and we have a plan, and it's all gonna happen, and it's gonna expand and change as we go. But right now, we still don't have that answer, and we really do need 
that answer. I, I can't tell the rest of the demographic that everything else is opening, but centers. I mean, we, yeah, and, we can uh, target that date. I hear you. And what we have done in response to all of your questions and support has been to get that plan up and out. I mean, up and ready with the Department of Health. And now what we need to do is get a date. Uh, but we want to share that information with the network. We're going to do that within, within a matter of a day or two and um, early next week. And, um, and so that people can start getting ready and to know exactly what the requirements are. Um, but I can't, I wish I could give you a date positive, but I hear you and well, uh, we'll go back and consider it and look at it. Getting all those steps in place, that's that's the, the answer so that we don't have to say, we still need to do this, this, and this. So as soon as we do have that guidance. Uh, it's been an honor working with, with you, your team, and, and Margaret, fighting for everything from transportation services, increased social services, guardianship. Uh, and like Margaret Chin said, uh, the mental health issue for seniors now post-pandemic, I've uh, been doing elder law for 30 years, is through the roof. So that will have to be something, even if we can't provide a social service worker in each center, some type of service hotline or help or addition, because the minute those centers open, I believe that's going to be the number one concern is the state of our seniors following the pandemic is not, it's probably worse than we thought it is. So um, to get that help, I thank you very much. Thank you, both chairs, and thank you for the additional time. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just before we go to council, I just want to say we have been joined by council members Cornegie, Dharma Diaz, Rosenthal, Gibson, Van Bremer, Jaeger, and Rivera. And I know that we have questions from council member Dharma Diaz and, and Robert Cornegie. Uh, and then I'm going to have to end it there. I will not go to a second round because we do have the Department of Investigation coming in to do their hearing. Uh, and it was supposed to start at 11, so we're running behind time. But thank you. Um, council, would you please call the next council member? Uh, yes. Can we have council member Dharma Diaz followed by council member Cornegie? Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for this, um, this opportunity. Council member Chin and, and Drummond has been excellent for me. And council member Lowe, thank you as well. As one of the newest members, I'm a sponge. So definitely it's a learning process. So the commission had three questions. I'm going to just ask one. In reference to you mentioned the grab and go, many of us are the impression that as of Monday, our centers would open up. I just had a conversation with one of my centers and they indicated that they're ready to go, but they have not heard back from DIFTA about their fundings being released so they can start purchasing. Can you please explain to me what the system is and if there's a disconnect? Uh, there is no disconnect. They got the information. Once they give us their, their, their needs, uh, we review that, we give them back their budgets. The money is there because we have not expended money on food. So I don't know where they're just gonna, they may be ready to go, but I think that they need to let us know that so we can. If you, I'd be more than happy to follow up with that sensor to see what is the, the issue, but I, I doubt seriously that there is anything on our end holding them up. All right, so I will, I will be more than happy to follow up with you on that. All right? I'm not looking to play the blame game. I just no, want the money to release. I. No, I, 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 thank I, you. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm not a blamer, I'm a fixer. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. We now have Council Member Cornegie. Starting time. Can you hear me? Now we can. Hey, Commissioner. Good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Great to see you. Good, good to see you as always. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Drum, Chair Chin. Uh, I am the proud recipient of NORC in my district, a relatively new NORC. Um, what the pandemic, though, has demonstrated to us is that we need an enhancement. Are there enhancements? In um, and what you've been talking about or the possibility for growth in those NORCs or is this all money or, or are we all talking about new NORCs? No, it, 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 it depends on the community need. Uh, there is, uh, I can't determine if, if a particular North NORC needs to be expanded. They may choose to, to consolidate and expand. Um, we cannot dictate that. The, the, 
nor, do, nor does the RFP prohibit that. So it is depending on the community assessment and then the community profile that that, that, that particular NORC or older adult center says how they're gonna address the needs of that particular community. Okay, because uh, what you know, obviously, um, isolation, and I think you've talked about this already. Isolation uh, was a huge portion of what the pandemic exacerbated, and you know, uh, our NORC and other networks were very creative in getting information to and connecting our seniors, even in spite of that. But we saw a need not to just leave it there, but to expand uh, uh, those opportunities for our seniors with access to technology, access to to, to, to remote learning, all of those kinds of things. Uh, so there's a hybrid system that we have in mind and that a lot of NORCs probably have in mind about what works, right? And how to actually, what we found was there was an ability to bring in more seniors, homebound seniors into the NORC system and into the engagement. Um, so I just wanted to know if there's a possibility for expansion and how we're looking at NORCs going forward they're certainly not ever going to be the same, just like the DOE is never going to be the same after this pandemic. Exactly. Right. We're looking forward to see what comes okay, in so the I, field also. Okay. So, so, so we'll definitely stay in touch, but thank you so much commissioner for the great work. Thank you so much. Um, both chairs uh, and, and no disrespect to anybody, especially uh, council member Chin, who, <laughs> as you already alluded to, is one of the biggest champions and advocates. And I, and I would proudly say, that um, we celebrate our NORC because of her advocacy and, and because yes. of her making the possibility for everyone. So I, I want to thank uh, no Chair No true words could have been spoken. <laughs> she, she pushed for yeah, that you NORC. Know, you know, we know. There's a lot of things we can't say on this Zoom, but you know we know, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> thank you, Chairs. Uh, and especially thank you, Chair Chen. Thank you. No worries, Councilmember Cornegie. Everything you said is exactly right. So... Council Member Chin, thank you. Uh, with that, I, I'm going to um, uh, end this part of the hearing. And let me just read my statement. And I want to thank you, Commissioner, again, for coming in. We do have follow-up questions, and we'll be uh, asking them uh, later on. So, um, <clears throat> okay, this will conclude the portion of today's hearing. Thank you, DIFTA, for being here. Uh, we will now take a break until 11 a.m. Well, it's actually after 11 a.m., I ask my colleagues who will be joining us for the DOI portion of the hearing to remain in this Zoom with your microphone muted until we are ready to begin. Again, Commissioner, thank you very much. Good luck. And we look forward to getting through this budget season working together with you. Thank you. Igualmente. Same here. Bye-bye. Okay. Igual. Ciao. Ciao. Uh, Chair Drum, I think we can go to your next portion of the script, uh, starting up for DOI, okay. whenever you're ready. And DOI is here with us now? They are. Oh, oh okay, I see you. Okay, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. All right. Good morning and welcome to the City Council's second day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2022. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Committee on Oversight and Investigations, chaired by my colleague, Council Member Vanessa Gibson. Um, I believe we are joined by, I'll get that in a moment, I think. Yeah, about who's uh, joining us. Um, We just heard from the Department for Aging and we'll now hear from the Department of Investigation. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement and I thank uh, Chair Gibson and uh, ask her to make her opening statement now. Thank you so much, Chair Drum and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our executive budget hearings. I am Council Member Vanessa Gibson and I'm proud to serve as Chair of the Oversight and Investigations Committee. I am so pleased to be conducting today's important hearing. And unfortunately, it will be my very last budget hearing as chair of this committee. Uh, today, I am joined by my good friend, the chair of the finance committee, Chair Danny Drum, and my other colleagues who've joined us today for today's fiscal 2022 executive budget hearing to review the budget for the Department of Investigation. 
The Department of Investigation promotes and maintains the integrity and efficiency in all government operations across the city of New York. To accomplish this, DOI's fiscal 2022 executive budget totals $53.2 million, including $29.4 million for personnel services to support 363 positions and $23.8 million in other than personnel services. I would like to thank Commissioner Margaret Garnett and her team at DOI for their steadfast work over the past year. The Department of Investigation has successfully worked to decrease the backlog of background investigations, perform important investigations, publish detailed reports, and issue policy and procedure recommendations to city agencies, all while a great deal of staff are working remotely. We thank you, Commissioner, and the entire Department of Investigation. I look forward to continuing our productive conversations with our oversight hearings. However, we do have a lot of work ahead, holding public officials accountable, ensuring that public tax dollars are spent lawfully and building faith and trust in honest government is an arduous undertaking. Today, I am interested in learning more about the DHS Integrity Monitor, the department staffing, and what is on the horizon for the Department of Investigation. As this is my very first, as mentioned, and last budget hearing as chair of the committee on o and I, I look forward to learning more about the department and the important role that DOI plays in New York. I wanna thank our committee staff for their hard work during this process. Our financial analyst, Jack Kern, unit head, Isha Reich, committee counsel, Johnita John, policy analyst, Noah Meeksler, my chief of staff, Justin Cortez. I wanna thank uh, Regina Pareda Ryan, Latanya McKinney, and the entire finance division for all of your incredible work. This is our second year in which we are holding the entire budget process remotely. And the finance division has done an amazing and exceptional job. And as I close, I want to thank you, Chair Drum, for your partnership. It's really been an honor. While I didn't come in the council with you, I've been serving with you alongside you for the past eight years. And for the past four years, we've been deputy leaders and on the budget negotiating team, and previously to O&I chairing the subcommittee on capital. And it's really been an honor to work with you. You are my friend, you are my advocate, and I look forward to continued success for both of us after we leave the council. So I thank you so much for your work, your efforts, and really making sure that the council's priorities are always at the forefront of our discussions. I look forward to today's conversation and I turn it back over to Chair Danny Drum. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Gibson. Thank you very much for your kind words. Um, you know, it's been a pleasure for me as well to be able to work with you over the last eight years, but particularly in your role as the chair of the subcommittee on finance, uh, which we worked on for three years together. And now in this important role, and I'm so happy that you took it on as uh, the chair of the uh, investigations and um, committee. And uh, you know, you're doing a fantastic job here. And I know that you were asked to do this and you stepped up to serve. So um, it's really uh, great to have had this opportunity to work with you. Um, you. Let me also uh, say that we have been joined um, by um, Council Member Adams, Amphrey Samuel, Ayala, Brooks Powers, uh, Dharma Diaz, uh, Gurdenchik, Kalos, Lewis, Rivera, Rose, Traeger, and Jaeger. And just bear with me one minute. I wanna thank you again, Chair Gibson. We'll now hear testimony from the DOI Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Garnett. Uh, before we hear from the Commissioner, I'll turn it over to our Committee Council to go over some, over some procedural items and to swear in the witness. Thank you, Chair Drum. My name is Noah Brick. I am counsel to the New York City Council Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everybody that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you have been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. During this portion of today's hearing, we will hear testimony from the Department of Investigation. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on to speak. 
We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I will now administer the affirmation to Commissioner Garnett. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Yes, I do. Thank you, Commissioner. You may begin when ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Gibson and members of the Committee on Oversight and Investigations and Chair Drum and members of the Finance Committee. My name is Margaret Garnett and I'm the Commissioner of the New York City Department of Investigation. On behalf of DOI, I'd like to especially welcome and recognize Councilmember Gibson as the new chair of this committee. My staff has really enjoyed introducing DOI to you and your team, and I look forward to working with you in this committee with however much time we have left, continuing to provide a window into DOI continue to navigate these unprecedented times together. I'm pleased to deliver this testimony via video, which is the second budget testimony we're presenting under the grip of the COVID-19 pandemic. The serious fiscal challenges that first emerged during the early days of the pandemic continue to affect the city and all city agencies, and DOI has shared in this burden. The budget cuts, citywide hiring freeze, and employee furloughs over the last year have presented weighty challenges for DOI, both in the present as, as it looks to build a stronger future. We have had to make hard choices and we continue to make them. Our goal is to navigate through a smaller budget and a reduction in headcount without significantly compromising the agency's work. However, the severe constraints on hiring salaries and promotions over the last year have had an impact on the agency, leaving us currently with a significant number of vacancies in our workforce and making it difficult to retain staff and establish a strong, flexible plan for the future. DOI is a unique law enforcement agency with a broad mandate to root out corruption, fraud, malfeasance, and other types of wrongdoing across the entire city. As a result, our work and our budget is focused on the investigations we do and the people who do them. Unlike many city agencies, DOI does not have programs or provide direct tangible services to the public. Therefore, there's no one program or area where DOI could cut to realize a large sum of savings. Rather, to satisfy the budgetary constraints that have been imposed on us, we have to look for small savings across the entire agency, asking staff to carry a heavier burden and do more with a smaller workforce and fewer resources. I want to recognize the determination and hard work by DOI staff that has made it possible to meet the fiscal goals we've been given. And I wanna share with this committee the dedication to public service that DOI staff has had in spite of the difficulties of this past year swiftly and successfully shifting into new and different work configurations as warranted by COVID-19. From transitioning to working remotely early last year to seamlessly moving to a mix of remote and on-site work schedules last summer, DOI staff has continued to do their jobs and advance the agency's mission, as well as willingly stepping up to assist other city agencies during the peak of the crisis, including transporting essential personal protective equipment to the city's hospitals, during the pandemic's early days, advising the citywide emergency procurement task force and offering to conduct expedited vendor name checks on companies being considered for pandemic related contracts. DOI also loaned two staff members from its fingerprint unit to assist DOHMH in conducting rapid background checks for their various programs, including the Learning Bridges program, which provided free childcare options for children from 3K through eighth grade on days they were remote learning. This past year is a story of extraordinary circumstances for us all. It has proven the resilience of New York City and its people. And at DOI, as at so many city agencies, it has reflected the perseverance of our employees and their continued commitment to public service. To understand our current situation, I wanna share some context about DOI at providing a foundation for the rest of my testimony, where I will discuss first the budget cuts and savings DOI has been able to realize, Second, the progress of certain reforms I implemented to strengthen DOI's investigative foundations. And third, the impact of COVID-19 on DOI and our productivity in the face of this year's many challenges. So I'd like to begin with providing the committee with some budget and staffing figures. The proposed budget for fiscal year 22 is $53.1 million, of which 3 million is a pass-through to fund a mayoral initiative to audit the nonprofit homeless service sector under DHS. The remaining 50.1 million supports DOI's personal services and other than personal services, 
in the amounts of 29.4 million and 20.7 million respectively. Fiscal 22 proposed headcount stands at 363 full-time staff. Although a significant number of vacancies and our limited hiring authority means we expect to begin fiscal 22 with a much lower active headcount. DOI's current expense budget for fiscal 21 is $58 million, consisting of 29.3 million in personal services for approximately 365 full-time budgeted staff positions. The budget includes 28.7 million for other than personal services, such as supplies, equipment, and our physical space at 180 Maiden Lane. Included in the 29.3 million for personal services is approximately 5.5 million in intra-city funding from memoranda of understanding with 13 other city agencies. An additional approximately 180 staff positions are funded through various arrangements with city agencies, including the memoranda of understanding I just mentioned, as well as staff working at DOI's Inspector General for NYCHA, Health and Hospitals, and the School Construction Authority. Thus, the total staff, staff headcount who report through DOI's chain of command on investigations is approximately 545, just under half of which are funded through financial arrangements with other city agencies or public authorities. For fiscal year 2021, the agency provided back to the city $2.5 million in savings, approximately $2.15 million in personal services that was realized through a reduction of 22 lines, employee attrition, mandated employee furloughs, and the citywide hiring freeze. Another 353,000 in other than personal services was achieved by evaluating all discretionary spending across the agency and finding ways to cut costs. For example, renegotiating some contracts or realizing that some procurements that had originally been planned for fiscal 21 will not occur until the following year thereby saving those costs in the current fiscal year. In fiscal 22, DOI has been directed to cut costs by approximately $1.95 million through similar approaches to cost savings, including a further baseline headcount reduction of seven lines. These reductions and con constraints come at a price, namely the inability to fill critical investigative positions over the last year, coupled with delays in promotions and merit raises all of which diminish DOI's ability to retain and hire qualified staff. We have attempted to focus our extremely limited hiring authority on areas that can benefit investigations across the agency, such as staffing for our new initiative discussed in last year's budget testimony, to create a centralized data analytics unit that will serve all of DOI's investigative squads. We have hired a director for this unit and are actively recruiting for three data analysts to staff it. The new investigator program is a second effort that is essential to shore up the agency's investigative foundation, and one we also discussed in last year's preliminary budget testimony, but then had to immediately place on hold due to the pandemic. This fiscal year and early next fiscal year, we hope to receive approval to hire two cohorts of five entry-level investigators each that would jumpstart this initiative, which will combine six months of intensive training on investigative techniques with close supervision on introductory casework. The goal of the program is to develop investigators who can then staff any one of our investigative squads, but also have a common understanding of investigative best practices, knowledge about the specifics of integrity and corruption investigations, a shared commitment to an internal culture of integrity, and preparation to meet the high professional standards that DOI expects. Despite the current fiscal constraints, filling investigative vacancies and doing so in a way that enables us to implement this new program is among the critical initiatives to ensure DOI's continued strength in investigations in the years ahead. There is no doubt that the fiscal realities of the last year, along with a significant slowdown in the criminal justice system and a diminished ability to do certain kinds of in-person field work, broadly affected DOI's operations in calendar year 2020 decreasing our number of arrests, recommendations issued, and new cases opened and closed, among other indicators. Given the pandemic's continuing hold on New York City, we are seeing similar trends in the first half of calendar year 2020, which we expect will begin to turn around once the city safely and fully reopens. My executive team and I have worked hard to ensure that the savings we must realize in our budget did not fall disproportionately on any one area of oversight because that would be a losing strategy for New York City. 
Rather, DOI has tried to absorb these cuts across the board. What that means is there are fewer DOI staff juggling more projects under greater resource pressure in every part of the agency. We're focused on minimizing the effect of these constraints on our work and our mission, shifting resources where necessary to staff high priority matters that impact public health and safety. We are also hopeful that the additional flexibility provided by the federal stimulus aid to the city will ease the burden on DOI in the year ahead and allow for approval of the mission critical hires I've just discussed. To better understand our current situation, I want to briefly provide some context about DOI and its mandate and how the reforms I have made since taking office in December of 2018 speak to furthering that mission. DOI is the city's inspector general, a law enforcement agency made up of attorneys, auditors, analysts, investigators, and administrative personnel. But that short description fails to acknowledge DOI's long legacy in New York City, how a massive corruption scandal led to its establishment in 1873, and how the agency has answered the call since then to root out corruption and fraud throughout its long history. As a result, DOI has an extensive statutory mandate and a distinct role within city government, protecting the city from corruption, fraud, waste, and malfeasance, exposing wrongdoing, and holding accountable those who seek to steal from the city or undermine its programs and operations, issuing recommendations to remedy the corruption vulnerabilities we find through our investigations, arming city agencies and city government with the facts in an array of areas so that informed decisions can be made, and educating city employees about their mandate to report corruption and fraud to DOI. At our core, DOI is a fact-finding agency. We provide the facts to fight corruption, fraud, and malfeasance that seeks to undermine the city, and we foster reforms to prevent this type of conduct from taking hold in the future. DOI's work provides the facts so that wrongdoers are held, held accountable and city operations can be strengthened and improved. DOI can and does investigate many matters solely on its own, but we also work with law enforcement partners such as the FBI and NYPD. And we partner with all of the area's prosecutors, including all five district attorneys, the state attorney general, and the two United States attorney's offices that cover our region. Our cases can result in criminal charges and can lead to administrative action by the relevant city agency. We affect arrests, but we stay behind after the arrest to recommend reforms that aim to remedy the systemic problems we uncover in our investigations. Our broad anti-corruption mandate includes investigating potential city whistleblower matters, conducting investigations requested by the mayor or city council, and serving as the designated investigators for the Conflicts of Interest Board, where we examine potential breaches of the city's ethics rules and provide those facts to the board so that the board can make a determination as to any penalties that may be appropriate. DOI also has a discrete and targeted role within the city's contracting process to provide information related to vendor name checks of vendors and its principals for contracts that meet the city's disclosure threshold of $250,000 or more. To do this, DOI checks its own internal databases and relays to the contracting agency whether DOI has previously investigated a vendor or its principals and had substantiated findings from those investigations. This step enhances the checks that agency contracting officers are expected to conduct, assisting city agencies to make their own determination as to vendor responsibility and whether a particular contract should be awarded. DOI also manages an integrity monitoring program that allows the city to, where appropriate, enter into or continue contracts with companies that might otherwise be precluded from doing business with the city due to integrity issues. Under this program, the companies agree to be monitored by an outside independent monitor that reports to DOI. Presently, we have approximately 10 vendors in this program. The city does not pay for these monitorships, rather the vendor pays the integrity firm directly. In addition to monitoring specific companies, DOI also has appointed integrity monitors to help the city oversee integrity issues on large scale city projects. For example, in the wake of Hurricane Sandy, NYCHA required an integrity monitor to oversee its recovery and rebuilding efforts at NYCHA properties. DOI acts effectively as a pass-through agency for that funding, which is approximately two and a half million dollars annually that goes directly to fund the integrity firm that provides the day-to-day -day oversight and reports to DOI. The same vendor integrity unit will be managing the monitorship of Bronx Parent Housing Network. DOI has an ongoing criminal investigation into financial improprieties at BPHN 
that began in 2020 and has already resulted in criminal charges against one defendant. Because this is an ongoing and active matter, I cannot provide further details about our investigation at this time. Alongside our ongoing investigation, we have been working closely with the city's Department of Social Services to strengthen its oversight of DPHN, including retaining a monitor that will report directly to DOI and provide additional oversight on BPHN's approximately $80 million in city contracts. In addition, DOI and DSS are working to retain an independent monitor that will also report to DOI to conduct an audit of all nonprofit homeless shelter providers with city contracts, providing greater oversight of how this important nonprofit sector is using city dollars and complying with city requirements designed to prevent fraud. Investigating city funded nonprofits in every sector continues to be an investigative priority for DOI. There are hundreds of city funded nonprofits that provide critical services to New Yorkers and do their jobs with integrity. However, DOI investigations continue to reveal corruption, waste, fraud, and other abuse in this area. In addition to investigations that have led to arrests and criminal charges, DOI regularly makes administrative referrals to city agencies that have highlighted issues such as potentially wasteful spending, conflicts of interest, family members on the organization's payroll and violation of city contracts, and other mismanagement that leaves this organization, city clients, and the city itself vulnerable. The city sends billions in taxpayer funds to these nonprofits and depends on them to provide an array of social services to the most vulnerable New Yorkers. And so it is an area where DOI continues to maintain a close eye and investigates regularly. A DOI investigation can start through proactive means, such as DOI deciding on its own to investigate a matter based on information it's obtained. It can begin through a specific request from the mayor, city council, or other relevant entity or through a tip or complaint from the public or city employees. DOI receives thousands of complaints annually. Each is reviewed to determine whether an investigation should be opened or whether it is more appropriate for another agency to handle the matter. For instance, investigators might examine whether the allegations involve potential criminal conduct that's under G DOI's jurisdiction or present issues that could be expanded into a broader probe among other factors. So far this fiscal year, DOI has received more than 9,500 complaints, and we have opened approximately 745 investigations. Complaints received by DOI that do not result in the opening of a DOI investigation may be referred to another agency that can more appropriately address the allegations made in the complaint. DOI also tracks and retains complaint information that's not yet ripe for an investigation to inform our proactive investigative work or to provide a base of information for future investigations. DOI is constantly balancing the, the public's right to know about our work with protecting confidential and sensitive information from our investigations. Part of DOI's mission is to promote government reforms, which often requires the support and engagement of the public and other government officials, including this council. The benefits of public engagement and transparency must be balanced, however, with the need to maintain confidentiality and integrity of our ongoing investigations so that we can do the most effective investigative work and so that individuals feel comfortable and confident stepping forward and providing information, particularly in light of the statute that mandates city employees report corruption to DOI. Finally, yes, we sure. haven't- I, I'm sorry, could you just, I, may I ask you just to wrap it up? <clears throat> We're very limited in our time. I appreciate the detailed report that you're giving. I just want to mention that it's, it is also online, but uh, if you could just wrap it up and we can get to questions, I'd appreciate it. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll try to speed through the rest. Um, we are regularly evaluating ways to be more transparent and use various tools to educate the public about our work. We've begun posting our annual whistleblower letter publicly. And last year we unveiled a policy and procedure portal on our public website which catalogs nearly 5,000 recommendations to city agencies since 2014. When I arrived at DOI in December of 2018, my top goals were to strengthen the agency's investigative structure and practices and rebuild trust with our investigative partners and within city government. I believe we've been successful in meeting these goals. One of the biggest problems we uncovered was the enormous backlog in our background investigations, as Chair Gibson mentioned at the start of her statement. Through reforming the structure of the background investigation unit and a lot of hard work by DOI's employees, we have already reduced the backlog by more than half. 
I'm happy to talk about that more with questions. Um, I just want to briefly touch on DOI's response to the pandemic. Uh, when all of New York State went on pause last March, DOI sent nearly all of its employees home and set them up to work remotely, which was an enormous task and one that I'm really proud to say I think the agency handled really successfully that has allowed us to operate at close to normal throughout the past year. Um, last July, we started bringing back a portion of our workforce to the office, and that has been very successful, both in terms of public of safety for our employees and continuing the mission of the agency. Um, I'll, I'll skip through the, the work that we've done the past year and just conclude by saying that the work of DOI is fundamental to the public's faith in good government, to the government's ability to hold itself accountable. I believe our work reflects good government in action. I'm really proud of the work of DOI staff over the past year under enormous challenges. Their professional dedication and commitment to public service and the vital mission of the agency were the engine behind all of our achievements in the past year. And I'm happy to take the council's questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I'm, again, excuse me, again, I'm sorry to have interrupted you. Uh, we have back-to-back -back, um, hearings um, all day and all month, as a matter of fact, so. Um, <laughs> it's, it's no uh, problem, I understand. It's an incredible time. <clears throat> In the last part of your uh, testimony, you mentioned the uh, COVID uh, uh, situation. So my first questions are around COVID. The city is receiving more than $16 billion in federal funding in fiscal 21 much of which is for COVID-19 support. Following Hurricane Sandy, the city also received a great deal of funding and DOI was involved in multiple investigations into the Hurricane Sandy recovery, one of which focused on the Build It Back program, ultimately saving the city an estimated $40 million. So what role will the department have in investigating the city's increase in COVID-19 related funds? <clears throat> So, you know, we've had a number of investigations, um, particularly early in the pandemic during what I would say the, the peak of the emergency contracting, um, at least one of which has already resulted in criminal charges in the Southern District of New York against vendors. Um, I think that you're absolutely right that the influx in the last couple of months of federal money that is funding many new programs around the city, I think, um, I guess to put on my sort of cynical prosecutor's hat will undoubtedly result in a lot of work for DOI. Um, I think any time, as we've seen in the past, any time there is a, a large influx of money to particular programs, particularly where that money is going to contracts um, to outside vendors, um, those end up being a, a font of work for DOI because where there's money, fraudsters follow. Um, so we are watching very closely. I think each time the city's announced a new program over the last about six weeks since we've gotten the confirmed federal stimulus, uh, DOI has been watching that money, asking questions, um, reaching out uh, just recently, I think had productive conversations with small business services about how to design the application program for the new uh, small business grant program that's gonna be operated out of SBS. Um, trying to offer our services in the early stages of programs to prevent fraud. Because what we have seen, uh, for example, in our SOTA special one-time assistance report from late 2019, that often the people that at agencies are designing application materials with, with good intent, but because of their own specialties without an eye towards potential fraud or protecting the city against potential fraud. So one of the things we have been doing um, over the last month and really since the beginning of the pandemic last year is more proactively reaching out to the city agencies that are administering these programs to offer our advice in the early stages rather than simply waiting until we start to see fraud. And Commissioner, in the beginning of your testimony, I think that you mentioned that there were some concerns that you had around hiring folks. Do you feel that uh, with this new influx of money coming in, that you'll have the capacity um, for um, you know, being able to properly investigate um, all of that funding that's coming in? Um, well, I mean, we definitely have challenges around our staffing and there's no getting around that. I think we have, um, as of July 1, when we get back some lines that are sort of artificially depressing our vacancies now, um, we have about 50 vacancies, nearly all of which are in investigative squads. So I think it, it's very important 
um, to me that DOI be able to ramp up its hiring and get appro that approval from OMB to ramp up investigative hiring um, as quickly as we can so that we have new folks in place um, for the concerns that you just mentioned. Commissioner, is that due to the three to one hiring uh, policy um, that you have had some difficulty with hiring? Uh, yes, yeah, so we, we came into the pandemic with about 25 vacancies, most of which were in um, investigative squads and due to attrition, which has been actually slightly below normal rates over the last year, um, we're now at around 50 vacancies. So over the last year, we have, since April of 2020, we have hired only three staff at DOI um, because the we've had a lot of difficulties with OMB in get, actually getting vacancies to translate into approved hires from OMB. So we have a handful of other positions that are in the hiring process now, which we hope to bring on board in the next month or two. Um, but the key for us is to fill these cohorts of new investigators that I talked about in my, in my testimony as quickly as possible. And that's good for us to know because, you know, ultimately uh, with your investigations, particularly in the area of funding for COVID, it might cost us a bit to pay for those investigators, but probably ultimately they'll be saving the city money. I, I think that's true. I mean, I think if you look at the history of DOI, um, our budget is really quite small, I think relative to many other city agencies. And, you know, just off the top of my head, you know, several ongoing investigations we have now that are potentially involve tens or hundreds of millions of dollars of fraud. Um, I do think that DOI pays for itself um, many times over, but it's we have to have people, right? That's the engine of DOI is its people. Um, so that's our biggest challenge going forward. And thanks, Commissioner. I wanna talk a little bit about the, um, one moment please, about the George Floyd uh, protest report. Um, you previously stated that the standard practice for DOI is provide an advanced copy of a report with the mayor and the respective agency both to uh, have facts checked and to afford agencies the time to thoughtfully respond to recommendations upon the report's release. Can you please expand on this? How far in advance are reports shared with the mayor and the relevant agency and how uh, is the length of time determined? So the length of time really depends on um, how complex the report is. So for matters that are less complex, shorter reports, particularly where we may have already been discussing with the agency our concerns. So I would give the SOTA report as an example, um, special one-time assistance, which is a, D, a DSS program to place homeless families in longer term, more stable housing. Um, because we'd been discussing, you know, for months, our concerns and investigation into that program with DHS, I believe that they saw a final draft of the report about a day and a half before it was issued, maybe two days before, and it went to City Hall at the same time. Um, on the Floyd report, um, the final draft went to the police department and City Hall about five days, a little less than a week. Um, oh, no, that's not true. We issued the report on a Thursday, and it went on Monday to the police department and to City Hall. You know, uh, as, as, as you'll recall, the report was about 125 pages, so it was quite um, expansive and dense. So our normal time period of about two days was expanded in that instance to, I guess, about four days. It went, it went on midday Monday, and it was issued Thursday morning publicly. Our concern was uh, really why wasn't it released to the council also at the same time? Can you elaborate on that? Um, so, I mean, normally when our report is about city agencies, the mayor is the executive in charge of all city agencies and responsible for implementing the policy recommendations that we make. So that's not a practice that I instituted. That's been the practice as far as I can tell forever at DOI that when it goes, when the final draft goes to the agency, it also goes to the relevant deputy mayor at City Hall. So I just wanna say though that the, the council, the speaker did also at the same time make that request. So we would have thought that we would have gotten an advanced copy uh, at the same time as the mayor. Is there a way to correct that situation so that this doesn't occur in the future? 
Yeah, so an advance copy did go to the speaker's office, but not as far in advance as the mayor, that's correct. When did the speaker get it? Um, I'd have to double check, but I believe it was the, the day before on Wednesday evening. On, on, on when, was it, when was it released, Commissioner? I'm sorry. On Thursday morning, December 18th. So barely a day before. Yes, that's right. And the mayor and the mayor got it the prior Friday. Am I right? No, on the, the at the beginning of that week, on the Monday of at that. The beginning week. of the week. I would like to say that we. I feel we should have gotten it the same time as the mayor got it. And, and, and I'll tell you why. The mayor released a video at 7:30 a.m. on December 18th in which he discussed the report that would become public later in the day. Um, his comments potentially influenced the way the report was uh, received as the public first heard from the mayor and not from DOI. So do you believe that the mayor's comments interfered with the reception of the report? And um, has any mayor or agency had done something similar in the past? Um, I'm not aware of any instance where the mayor or mayoral agency has done something similar in the past. Um, it certainly uh, was our understanding that the report would first become public when DOI released it at either 10 or 10.30. I can't remember the precise time uh, that morning on December 18th. So um, that we, we were not part of the planning on the video or the mayor's release of it. Okay, obviously he had some advantage in, in terms of being able to release that report before we got a hold of it. So. Um, I hope that in the future, if there's a recommendation from both the mayor and the council that we would receive the report at the same time. Is that something that you can commit to now? Uh, yes, I, I think that's a reasonable request. I think it's an unusual circumstance that that happens, but I, I definitely hear your concerns. And um, I think, as I said, I think what happened regarding the video and how that played out was not DOI was not part of that, and that was unusual in, in terms of our reports and what would normally happen. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, let me just go back to something that you said about OMB. Uh, what is the OMB? What is OMB's rationale for not allowing you to hire? Uh, there have been a series of challenges and explanations as to what that's based on. I think that um, you know there have been a, a number of different. Uh, policies announced by OMB over the last year with regard to what the hiring approval is. Um, so there was a complete freeze, understandably, in the city's hiring from March until through July. At that point, um, a three, three for one uh, system was introduced, but it was not retroactive. I mean, it didn't include existing vacancies. It was limited only to on a going forward basis. You had to accrue vacancies to uh, from July forward to get approval on a three for one basis for a hire. Um, at the end of the year, uh, we submitted uh, at OMB's request, a, pro uh, a request for mission critical hires and a small number of those that DOI requested were approved through that process. And we've been working on getting those hires on board. But I think that the, you know, Part of the delay that we've experienced over the last year has been um, essentially long delays with many layers of approval at OMB before a particular hire is approved. Mm -hmm. So it's not as if um, once you have three vacancies, there's essentially automatic approval for one hire. There's a process there um, and all of that takes a great deal of time. And the net result has been, as I said, that since April of 2020, we've had only two people actually start at DOI. We have a third person with an accepted offer who should be starting shortly. Um, and it's just been a very lengthy and challenging process to navigate that with OMB. We'd really like to work with you on that and uh, see that you get the resources that you need, especially with this COVID funding coming in. I feel that it's very important. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. We would welcome that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and my last question, I used to be a New York City public school teacher before I got elected to the city council, is just on the special commissioner of investigations. So the special commissioner for investigation fills a similar role as DOI, but for the Department of Education. Can you describe the way DOI and SCI work together? For example, do you share best practices, support each other's work, mm -hmm. refer complaints to each other? 
uh, how often do you work together and so on? And does DOI refer complaints to SCI? And if so, how many are referred annually? Um, so the, we have tried to follow the findings and recommendations of the McGovern report on the structure of our relationship with SCI. So essentially SCI operates largely independently as an investigative agency um, with a limited reporting function to me. So um, I would say I have a, a great, a very cordial and um, positive working relationship with Anastasia Coleman, who's the special commissioner for investigation. But SCI conducts its investigations independently and DOI is really a resource to SCI where they need help, guidance, assistance. So in general, I talk to Commissioner Coleman at least once a month, typically more often, um, just to check in, see how things are going, share with her, for example, the way that DOI handled remote work, um, adapting to the pandemic, um, any training that we're offering, things of that nature. Um, I receive copies of every referral, SCI referral that goes to the chancellor. Um, so I review those regularly. I get sort of a batch of them once a week and review them. And if I have any concerns, questions, suggestions, I'll reach out to Commissioner Coleman to offer those. Um, and she, you know, she will sometimes call me independently for advice um, about how we've handled a particular investigation. Um, on referrals, when we when DOI receives complaints um, that relate to the Department of Education matters under SCI's jurisdiction, we send those complaints on to SCI to investigate. Um, I don't have the exact number at my fingertips, but we can get that for you if you'd like. Okay, all right, thank you, Commissioner. I'm gonna now turn it over to um, my co-chair, uh, Chair Gibson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Drum, and good afternoon, Commissioner. Thank you for your testimony and outlining all of the work uh, that your agency has done over the past year during COVID, a lot of the goals and you know guidelines that you're following. I just had a couple of questions. I know uh, the hour is late uh, today. Uh, in your testimony, you talked about the uh, executive budget adding $3 million for the DHS Integrity Monitor. Um, this is the department's first new need since the fiscal 2020 executive plan. So I wanted to understand, is this funding of an integrity monitor a result of executive order 64, or was there another mandate that calls on this implementation of an integrity monitor? So there was an, uh, another mandate that relates, it doesn't relate to executive order 64. It relates to the mayor's announcement in the wake of um, the BPHN story in the New York Times that the city would be conducting an independent uh, monitorship of the entire sector of homeless services. So there's really two things. One is the process that we're in with DHS to conduct appropriate oversight of just BPHN, Bronx Parent Housing Network by itself. At the same time, and the $3 million new needs is to fund the, to fund the, seeing to fruition that mayoral mandate. Um, so uh, as, as, as I know you know, um, Council Member Gibson from our hearing last week, um, the process there is that DOI and DHS jointly developed a questionnaire for all approximately 75 homeless services providers um, that are under contract with DHS um, that was focused on gathering information that relates to many of the kind of red flags for potential fraud that DOI has found from its investigations over the years in this sector. At the same time, we've issued an RFP for that outside auditor to conduct the audit and the precise parameters of the audit of the entire sector will be driven by the results that we get back from those questionnaires. So that is money, the $3 million is to fund that monitorship of the entire sector is really an audit more than a monitorship of the entire sector of nonprofit homeless providers that have contracts with New York City. Okay, so the $3 million we're talking about includes an actual monitor and all of the staffing that would oversee all of our homeless service provider contracts, correct? That's right. That's right. Okay. So the majority of the funding is to will pay the audit firm that will conduct the independent audit 
And um, as part of that, DOI requested the uh, one line of staff within DOI who will work in our integrity monitoring unit that essentially will oversee the work of the outside audit firm. Okay, I understand the surveys are due in June. Uh, right. When do you expect the integrity monitor to be announced? And is this a one-time funding uh, stream? I, I don't imagine this would extend into another fiscal year. Is that correct? No, it's a one-time. It's a one-time funding stream, and the three million is a not to exceed three million. Um, so that that that's the basis for the RFP. Um, we have been conducting the questionnaire process with providers on a parallel track with the um, RFP process to secure the monitor so that we're not losing any time in this process waiting for the questionnaires to come back. Um, so I expect that we'll be in a position to um, announce the audit firm, audit firm shortly after um, we receive the results of those questionnaires. So okay. this, uh, this summer and then the the basis of the RIP is that the matter will be completed in less than 12 months. Okay, so DOI, DSS will oversee the integrity monitor over the course of a year or less. Yes. And then after that commences, you'll expect the recommendations to be made by the monitor that ultimately would be implemented by DOI and DSS jointly? Uh, yeah, so, so the monitor will report to DOI um, and depending on the nature of those reports, um, you know, certainly any matters that suggest further investigation or potential criminality will be taken from there by DOI and matters that relate to the overall oversight of the sector by DHS, um, those recommendations will go to DHS. Okay. Okay. This is uh, very interesting. I think $3 million is, is a lot of money. So that's why I had to ask a questions about what we're looking to do. Um, I you know, realized that New York Times article that came out uh, overseeing all of our homeless service provider contracts and really making sure we operate more efficiently, we root out waste and fraud and abuse. Um, I appreciate the effort. Um, I just think $3 million is just a, a lot of money. And some of my colleagues agree they're nodding their heads. Okay. Um, I have a quick question about the Office of Inspector General at the NYPD. Mm -hmm. um, they released their annual report on April 1st and included a series of updates to the previous report that they, they had issued, uh, and as well as recent actions of the Office of Inspector General. And they talked about the NYPD's response to the George Floyd protests. Mm -hmm. um, because this was released so close to the issuance of the annual report, DOI had not yet completed your own evaluation of the NYPD's response to your recommendations to be included in the annual report. So confusing. Um, so I want to understand how long would it take DOI to complete your analysis of the NYPD's response to all of your recommendations? So um, the local law 70 includes only annual reporting on the status of the recommendations that we make to the NYPD. So the annual report captures those and there's a lengthy back and forth process between DOI and the police department to settle on what is the police department's view and what is DOI's view of the status of each issued recommendation. When it comes to the Floyd protest report, as you noted, the statutory 90 day period for the police department to respond um, came in late March, very close to the issuance of the annual report. So the annual report this year contains only the police department's position on the status of implementing those recommendations. So at DOI, we typically are updating um, our public recommendations portal for all city agencies on a quarterly basis. So my hope would be that we would have some update um, in that portal on the status of DOI's view as to the status of the Floyd protest report recommendations um, by the middle of June, mid to late June, when we next do an update for that portal. The, the, okay. sort of, the, uh, the official update um, that pursuant to Local Law 70 will come in next year's annual report on April 1 of 2022. But my hope okay. is that we'll have some something to report before then. Okay, and so DOI is committed to publishing the analysis once it's complete? Yes. 
Yes, we do okay. that. And to what extent does DOI have the ability to hold the NYPD accountable to fulfill a lot of the recommendations uh, that you're suggesting? If you look on the portal, many of them are in process, right? Nothing has been really complete. And I think a lot of New Yorkers following all of the protests really want to ensure that there is a level of accountability. And a lot of the recommendations New Yorkers support, but how do we ensure that the department is fulfilling as many of those recommendations as legally uh, we can allow them to do. So DOI's role in, in, that, in that process for the police department or any city agency is simply providing the information publicly to the council, the public, the mayor, the agency. Um, and we, we, we track it and provide transparency. We have no ability to force agencies to do anything that we think we should they should do. And my own view is that that's appropriate. I think the places in a democratic government that should be able to force other parts of government to do things are the council and city hall. Um, so we, we make recommendations and we publicly track the, their status for every city agency on our public website. Um, every recommendation we've made can be tracked, the status of it, um, on our public website since 2014. I, I, I shouldn't say forever, since 2014. Um, so that's how DOI's role is to is to persuade and to provide the tools um, for other entities, whether it's the public or other parts of city government, to take action based on our recommendation and the, what their status is. I want to ask a quick question about the uh, backlog of investigations and where we are with that. I know you had a ambitious agenda when you first became commissioner and took on that role of reducing the backlog. Uh, what's the update and where we are today? Um, so in this, in early 2019, when I first st started to try to get my arms around the background investigation backlog, the backlog was about 6,500 uh, background applicants were in the backlog. Um, as of May 1st, that number is down to about 3,000, it's 3,030 um, applicants still in the backlog. So in less than two years, we've reduced that by more than half. Um, when we testify, when I testified about this issue in February of 2020, I believe shortly before the pandemic, we, we said then, and, and it's still true today, that we are on track to meet the promises we've made to the council um, to have the backlog totally eliminated by, at that time, I think I said January of 2024. Um, it's certainly my hope that we will get there before then um, given the progress we've made so far. So we continue to make, I think, great progress eliminating the backlog. And I think equally importantly, at the same time that we've done that, um, the restructuring of the background unit has meant that since the summer of 2019, we have been meeting our, our forward-looking ongoing obligations to the city by doing all the background reviews that have come in since July of 2019 in a timely fashion. So the vast majority of those have been completed in less than six months um, with an average time to completion of under 120 days. So the restructuring, I think, has enabled us to do both of those things, you know, starting today, which today being July of 2019, um, meeting our obligations in a timely manner, as well as at the same time, um, dramatically reducing the backlog. Great. I had a, a quick question about the fees from marshals that the department collects on uh, the regulation of our marshals as it relates to residential commercial evictions, uh, seizing utility meters, and uh, ultimately carrying out evictions. All of that revenue that is collected is overseen by the Department of Investigation. I just wanna understand where that revenue goes. And since COVID-19, um, obviously all the moratoriums that we have been faced with around residential and commercial evictions. Um, what oversight, if any, does DOI have as it relates to any of this revenue that we collect uh, when evictions are processed? So um, we have, the marshals are not DOI employees. They're, they're right. independent actors appointed by the mayor, but we are their regulator. And um, right. we regulate how they conduct themselves we require rep their financial reports. Um, they make their financial reports to DOI um, and DOI collects a portion, you know, fees based on their revenue 
um, as you noted, that go, though that money goes into the city's general fund, it's just not retained by DOI. Um, we, we turn that back over to the city. Um, but I think that you're absolutely correct um, to note that the sort of the revenue predictions for this year based on fees from marshal activities, I expect will be dramatically lower than they've been in the past, you know, in the past because um, almost no evictions, commercial or residential, have occurred uh, since March of 2020. Um, the, the slowdown and limited capacity of the courts during that time has also meant a significant slowdown in um, another fee generating work of the marshals, which is serving liens from civil judgments. Um, that's another fee generating aspect, as well as utility meter work and um, the booting of cars for scoff laws on parking fines. So all of those activities have been down, some of them quite dramatically because, of course, of the um, eviction moratoriums of the last year. So I, I do expect that revenue to be down very dramatically in this year. Okay, thanks. No, I just wanted to know if there was any influence that DOI had over the revenue. Um, I'm, we're always thinking of ways to repurpose funds um, in, in more of a preventative way. Um, as you look at, you know, keeping people in their homes and their businesses and things of that nature. So uh, future conversations that we'll be having uh, with, with the DOI and the city over that. Okay. Okay. My final question, because I have colleagues that do have questions and I want to move on, is about the policy and procedure recommendation, the PPR portal that right. DOI operates. Um, really want to learn a little bit more about the operations and the management of it. Um, in terms of informing the public on the recommendations that are issued by the department and the agency's willingness to accept and implement any recommendations. This is still a relatively new program, right? It's a little over a year. And I wonder what takeaways DOI has about the portal. Uh, have you seen any hitches, any successes? How can we make the portal more accessible to New Yorkers? How do New Yorkers find out about it? And is it user friendly? Are we learning anything after a year to see how we can operate more efficiently for New Yorkers? Yeah, so you know, I think this is an initiative that we're really proud of at DOI. Um, it was a massive undertaking um, to create a publicly searchable and accessible uh, database. It goes back to 2014. It's nearly 5,000 recommendations that DOI's issued to city agencies since 2014, um, and it is searchable, word searchable, as well as sortable by, by the agency to which the recommendation was issued, by date, by status. Um, so what it reports is the agency, the date of the recommendation, the full text of the recommendation that was made, um, and the current status, as well as any note, there's a, a field for notes or agency comments. Um, the status is DOI's view of what the status is of the recommendation, accepted, not accepted, implemented, not implemented, um, and so on. So unfortunately, I think we were, you know, on your larger question of how, um, how have people used it, I think we were unfortunate victims of a pandemic timing because we had, we had planned a major rollout event to introduce the PPR portal to the press and the public and, and city government at large for, I believe our planned event was March 18th of 2020, um, to really introduce this to the public and to the media that covers city government and might be interested in using this um, in the furtherance of public transparency. So, you know, instead we just did, of course, a press release, we couldn't have an event. Um, and I think the public has been accessing, I mean, we don't, of course, DOI doesn't track who who is accessing the portal, um, that, that's through our public website. So we don't track it. Um, anyone can look at it without being tracked. I don't mean to suggest that. Um, so we think it's been successful. We've been updating it quarterly. We think it's, as a technical matter, it works extremely well. I certainly would encourage um, any members of the press who cover city government, advocates who are interested in particular issues or city agencies or the members and staff of the council to take advantage of it. And if, if anyone who uh, wants to use the portal has any technical difficulties that they notify DOI right away because 
We think it's a tremendous step forward in transparency of our work. Um, it's a great feature uh, for the public, the media, the council, um, and we'd encourage everyone to take advantage of it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Chair Drum, but I want to thank you again as my first hearing under this new leadership chairing ONI um, for the cooperation of your staff and the partnership of you and your team. And I look forward to working with you on your priorities, a lot of initiatives and your ongoing work. It's been challenging for all of us and certainly all of our city agencies have stepped up in a major way, working remotely uh, with less staff and more work. Uh, it's been a huge undertaking for all of us, but I've seen so many New Yorkers step up in ways that we never ever imagined we would have to, but we did it because that's exactly what we needed to do. So I thank you and I look forward to our work during this budget process. And I thank you, Chair Drum. Looking forward to our conversation. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, thank you, Chair Gibson. Uh, let me say that we have been joined by council members Eugene Cabrera and Lander. And I know that we have questions from at least two council members. Uh, council, would you please call on the council members? Thank you, Chair Drum. My name is Noah Brick and I'm counsel to the New York City Council Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I'm so sorry, I'm reading the wrong portion of the script. Let's try this. Um, if any council members have questions for DOI, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you'll be added to the queue. Council members, please keep your questions to five minutes, including answers. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to tell you when your time begins. The Sergeant will then let you know when your time is up. We will hear now from council member Adams followed by council member Lander. Start in time. Okay, I was finally unmuted. <laughs> thank you very much, Chairs Drum, Chair Gibson. Thank you so much for having this hearing this morning. Commissioner, it's a pleasure to see you this afternoon, I should say. We're into the afternoon already. Uh, hopefully my question is a quick one. It has to do with um, rampant issues around uh, a placard abuse, which continue um, in the city year after year after year. Uh, I just need to know whether or not DOI um, is involved in placard enforcement, and if so, how? That's the first part of my question. The second part of my question in the interest of time is going to have to do, if so, um, is going to have to do with the, uh, uh, apparently there was a sign that was placed, a uh, fake sign that was placed or signed, uh, according to the patch today, signed, uh, nailed to a tree near Washington Heights uh, NYPD precinct. Are you aware of that? Um, and what will DOI do about that? So that's uh, part A and part B to my question. Thank you. Uh, so on, on part A on the placards, I think DOI has done and continues to do um, a number of investigations and cases related to forged and fake parking placards. Um, in the past year, we had two separate criminal matters, one of an assistant commissioner in a city agency um, who pled guilty to a misdemeanor um, related to a use of a forged uh, fake parking placard, as well as a investigation and criminal matter into a ring of people, including four city corrections officers who were uh, using and selling forged disability parking placards. Um, we've done a number of conflicts of interest board matters that relate to the misuse of placards as well um, in a number of city agencies, including at health and hospitals, which was made public this past year. Um, so I think our, our work in placard abuse is mostly focused on things that um, are either violations of the conflicts of interest board rules or forged and fake placards, um, which could result in criminal action. I think one, you know, a, a the largest area for placard enforcement is with the police department's traffic enforcement bureau. DOI cannot issue parking summonses or tickets um, or anything of that nature for um, illegal parking. And so I think a lot, a, a huge portion of what falls under the umbrella of placard abuse um, are matters that really are up to the enforcement of the NYPD's traffic enforcement bureau. Commissioner, how has uh, DOI educated or continued to educate uh, workers on the issue of placard abuse? Because it, it really is still very significant in the city. Yeah, so I think, you know, as uh, we do a tremendous amount, during normal times, we do a tremendous amount of anti-corruption um, training and lecturing to city uh, employees. That has been down significantly over the past year because of the pandemic 
uh, presenting difficulties for that. But misuse of city benefits, whether that is using your city ID or badge to get a benefit or get out of a ticket, or misuse of city cars, or plaque parking placards has been a significant part of our training over the years, as well as our enforcement, and that, that continues. Thank you. I just think that there's still so much more to be done. The complaints are still through the roof, um, and we see them on a daily basis. Uh, I'd like to see DOI continue to ramp up uh, when it comes to um, enforcement around placard abuse, and uh, thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you. Councilmember Lander. Starting time. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. It's good to be here for this hearing. Um, I'm encouraged to see so many things, you know, in the executive budget that were not in the preliminary budget that we are, uh, that it's great to see. So Commissioner and, and Deputy Commissioner, thank you. It's encouraging to see the funding for the streets master plan for the crash investigation unit. I asked about the installation of the 10,000 bike racks at the preliminary hearing and the fact that the $3.6 million uh, is put in the executive budget is great. And of course, I'm enthusiastic about the funding for the dangerous vehicle abatement program and glad that that will be beginning uh, and stepping up in earnest in the, in the year to come. I have two questions. Um, first, Commissioner, at the preliminary budget hearing, I asked you to take a look at the Parkside Avenue bike lane and that one block where there's only a six foot two way lane that is really too narrow. Um, and I meant to follow Council up. Member Lander. Sorry? Uh, this, is, this is the Department of Investigations. Oh, this is not the DOT hearing? No, no, and I haven't started that yet. I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay, thank you, Council Member Lander. <clears throat> Council Member uh, Rosenthal, is your question about investigations? Yes, it sure is. Great, you may commence when ready. Thank you. Um, sorry for the noise, I am in Central Park. Um, uh, Commissioner, thank you for all your good work. Uh, I'm wondering, um, this isn't quite a budget question, except it has to do with your unit that investigated the NYPD Special Victims Division. Um, I'm wondering uh, whether or not you plan to uh, issue another report, um, sorry, given your uh, 2018 report showed that so much work had to be done at the Special Victims Division. Um, and that was just uh, a report about the adult squad. Uh, at that time, you had said, the department had said they would be investigating the child squad next. Could you talk a little bit about where you are with that investigative unit and whether or not you're going to be doing uh, an additional more investigation. Um, so, you know, we don't typically talk about ongoing investigations. I know that the um, NYPD IG unit has been engaged over the last years in uh, discussions and a lot of work on potentially the child uh, victims part of special victims. Um, but I don't have anything I can say publicly now about the status of that. I will say on the special victims report, um, I know this is a, a, a focus of yours, Council Member Rosenthal, but um, I think we're really uh, proud to report in this year's annual report on April 1st, that there's been over the last year, really significant progress in implementing some of the investigations from that report. Um, I think that there had, it, it was a slow road, but a number of those investigations um, have, have shown, a number of those recommendations have progressed in terms of their implementation at NYPD over the last year. Uh, can you name one? Um, so I, I don't have the list in front of me, but I think the opening of those facilities and improvements in staffing are two areas that have shown improvement over the last year in terms of implementation. Right. Implementations. So with all due respect, uh, we got one new unit uh, in Manhattan there's still, we're still waiting for sighting in Queens and in Brooklyn. Um, Bronx has been somewhat renovated, but the site, even the Manhattan site is too small because they were not built for the additional staffing. So, so far, their one possible positive step has fallen short. Uh, they need more space because 
they are not staffing to the level that would be required to do a thorough investigation and they still refuse to do the analysis uh, or think about the Pumel model to have a staffing level where, uh, you know, investigators are not depressed, sleeping on the job, overworked, uh, asking still questions in a way that is not trauma informed. I haven't seen any additional training at the last uh, hearing with Commissioner Shea, he said that they have not done a FETI training for a number of years. So I'm surprised to hear that your takeaway is so very, very different than mine. And I'm wondering if you would consider going back and rethinking your findings a little bit. I mean, I, if, if that, if DOI is really satisfied with where NYPD is, I, I would love to have a follow-up meeting with you and understand why you seem to think uh, anything is better now for women or people who come forward who have been assaulted than it was in 2018. I think it's only, the word I get from the advocates is it's only gotten worse. So I think, I, I wouldn't say that we are satisfied with where things are and I, I didn't mean to give that impression. And I think we're absolutely have, welcome a meeting with you to hear more about your concerns and see where the gap is, I think, and what we're, we think we're seeing at NYPD on this issue and what you're hearing from advocates. So we would welcome that meeting. Thank you. Do you think you have enough staff to do another uh, a thorough investigation of the NYPD? Because DOI is the only independent agency who could possibly help sort things out there. Otherwise, it's just NYPD reporting on itself, you know, and you know they don't put out information. And, you know, they've been through two different uh, people to run the SDD. They've reorganized it several times, never with success. So I'm just wondering if you feel you have enough staff to do a proper investigation because I'm happy to call on the administration to add investigative staff for the NYPD in particular in my mind for the SVD but I'm sure there are multiple other divisions that need investigation is that something that you think DOI needs? So I think that we have um, adequate headcount but where we where we're having difficulty is approval to fill the vacancies we have. So it's not a question, I think, of, of adding positions, but rather being able to fill the vacancies we have so that we're operating at full strength. Could you, um, I, I'm going to stop my questions because I know other people have, have questions, um, but just it, so I'm going to follow up with you on a meeting. Really appreciate that offer. I'd love to, you know, have your team there and, and hear the thoughts. But secondly, if you could just send over to the committee the number of um, headcount that are, are meant to be filled and how many vacancies um, there are, you know, that you're waiting to fill more. And my interest is in the special victims division of the NYPD. Perhaps, I mean, I leave it to the committee to ask about um, other divisions as well, but in particular, I'd like to know the headcount at DOI and what, what positions are waiting to be filled because we're anxious, the advocates are anxious to have some meaningful follow-up uh, given that, you know, I strongly believe that the NYPD has not changed its way, its ways at all uh, since DOI issued what was a seminal report that I ad admire and am proud to turn to. So thank you very much. Um, that was a nod of the head, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. We, we can provide more detail to the committee on, on our vacancies and, and where they are. Happy to do that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Chair. Thank you very much. And Commissioner, thank you as well. We do have a lot of follow-up questions that we weren't able to get to. I'm sure we'll get them over to you, though. I appreciate you uh, coming and giving testimony uh, and uh, being open with us about uh, what you've done since we started at the... Uh, Department of Investigation. So thank you. We're going to conclude this portion of today's hearing. Uh, uh, Chair Drum, 
Let yes. me just interject. Uh, uh, Councilmember Diaz, is your question for DOI or DOT? DOI, and it's brief. Uh, okay. uh, uh, Councilmember Diaz. Thank you for this opportunity. My, my, my question is in reference to the $3 million deal conversation that you're having, which I find to be extreme and perhaps unnecessary. Would you be able to share with the council the tool that's going to be used by the auditing firm that you're going to use? The, 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 the tool? I'm not sure I understand the question. I come from the DHS world and when we monitor, it's called the monitoring tool. I, I like to know your questions that, that, that you're going in with. What are you looking for? Uh, so the, we intend to structure the audit in terms of division between a uh, a, a deep dive audit versus what we would consider to be a desk audit of policies and um, financial filings based on the responses from the questionnaires that went out to um, the 70 plus providers um, that, that are due back in June. So based on the answers to those questionnaires as well as other information that DOI or DHS has about the providers, um, the, the audit for, firm's work will be structured into two groups those providers that will get a full scale audit of their finances, policies and operations, and those providers that will get what we would call a desk audit, um, which just would involve reviewing their policies around nepotism, professionalization of the board, um, executive salaries, a number of issues that we have identified over the years um, that would be a That doesn't seem much different to me or different at all from what OTDA comes in with. I'm more than happy to have a separate conversation with you, but someone that has gone through the OTDA process, I really don't see much different than what you're sharing with us today. I mean, we're, uh, we're happy to set up a meeting with you and your staff to talk about how that review um, is being planned and what it will look like. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Commissioner, for coming in and giving testimony today. Um, we're going to now move into the uh, Department of Transportation portion of this hearing. Uh, and I am going to welcome uh, Commissioner Gutman um, for, and thank him for being here. Uh, we have been joined by uh, a few council members, a number of council members, council members Rosenthal, Adams, Ayala, Dharma Diaz, Reverend Diaz, um, Holden, Ku, Lander, Rivera, and Yeager, and we'll be joined by Council Member Rodriguez shortly. Um, so um, with that, I'm going to ask Council to, I'm going to forego my opening statement and we're going to ask Council to swear in the witness and then we'll proceed. Thank you, Chair Drum. My name is Noah Brick and I'm counsel to the New York City Council Committee on Finance. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are recognized to speak, at which time you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you've been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. During this portion of today's hearing, we will hear testimony from the Department of Transportation. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you will be called on to speak. You will be limiting, we will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including responses. I will now administer the affirmation to the administration witnesses. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Commissioner Gutman? Mr. Uh, Jaron? I do. And Mr. Ott? I do. Thank you all. Commissioner Gutman, you may begin when ready. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Drum, Chair Gibson, uh, members of the of the Council of the Transportation and Finance Committees. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting us to appear today. I'm Hank Gutman. I'm the commissioner of the New York City 
Department of Transportation. With me today are Joseph Jaron, the Executive Deputy Commissioner, and Zeeshan Ott, Director of Government Affairs. Uh, we're pleased to testify today on behalf of Mayor de Blasio on the DOT's fiscal year 22 executive budget and the fiscal year 21 to 31 capital plan. Uh, needless to say, today uh, I'm testifying before you on a very different budget than the one I testified on two months ago. The pandemic hit us hard, but as the mayor has said, together we will fight back and drive a recovery in every neighborhood. This recovery budget is a historic stimulus-driven investment in the city's comeback for which we are grateful to Congress and the Biden administration, as well as the city administration, of course. The DOT's work touches every aspect of life in the city and is essential to the city's recovery. With an addition of 140 million to the DOT's baseline expense budget and 4.2 billion to the capital budget, we will continue to reimagine our streets, double down on Vision Zero, provide more public space in communities across the city, speed up buses for our transit riders, maintain our infrastructure, and continue to operate the Staten Island Ferry. Uh, a few key highlights that I'd like to mention in my testimony. First, uh, the DOT's proposed $24 billion fiscal year 21 to 31 capital plan includes $11.4 billion for bridge reconstruction and rehabilitation, $3.9 billion for street reconstruction, $3.2 billion for, for resurfacing, $3.4 billion for sidewalk and pedestrian ramp repair and reconstruction, $497 million for the Staten Island Ferry, 1.1 billion for streetlight signals and automated enforcement, and 626 million for the facilities and equipment needed to support the DOT's operations. Our 1.1 billion fiscal, fiscal year 21 expense budget includes 357 million for traffic operations, including signals, streetlights, automated enforcement, and parking. 196 million for roadway maintenance, 106 million for bridge maintenance and inspection, 125 million for transportation planning and management, including installation of street signs and roadway markings, 102 million for ferry operations and maintenance, and 251 million for other DOT operations and administration, including sidewalk management and inspection. A few of the highlights as to where that money's going. First, the Manhattan Greenway. As the mayor announced, we are incredibly excited that working alongside our partners at the EDC and the Parks Department, we will be completing the Manhattan Greenway, the most traveled bikeway in America. $723 million in capital spread across the three agencies' budgets will fund completion of the Harlem the River Waterfront from Sherman Creek to University Heights Bridge in Inwood, the Harlem River Waterfront from 145th Street to High Bridge Park in Harlem and Washington Heights, the UN Esplanade from 41st to 53rd Streets, and the East River Pinch Point from 13th to 15th Streets. Next, open streets. In community so across the five boroughs, open streets provided a true bright spot in a very difficult year. And thanks to the council's partnership, it's now becoming a permanent fixture across all five boroughs. Funding in this budget will allow us to support the city's nation leading program as it becomes permanent and to provide more support for community partners to create a sustainable and equitable program. The budget funds two additional DOT staff and necessary funding for maintenance and operations. It also funds the City Cleanup Corps, a New Deal style job creation program announced by the mayor to support the program and to provide jobs uh, for young people. Open restaurants. 
Next, this budget invests in the open restaurants program to support permanently, to support its permanence and to streamline the application process. In response to this crisis of the pandemic last year, DOT had to reassign staff from across our operations and our sister agencies for inspections and outreach. This allowed the city quickly to stand up the program in support of our city's beloved restaurant industry while indoor dining was banned or limited and helped save over 100,000 jobs. With funding allocated in, in this budget, we will add 34 new positions to manage the permanent program, including two positions in the mayor's office for people with disabilities. Vision Zero. On Vision Zero, this budget will provide 46 million in fiscal year 22, ramping up to 59 million in fiscal year 25, and the baseline in funding for operations and maintenance of 360 new speed cameras in fiscal year 21 and 600 new cameras in fiscal year 22. This will bring the total to 2,220 cameras citywide and will expand the reach of these life-saving devices. And in addition to DOT's portion of the Manhattan Greenway, this budget funds a number of Vision Zero Capital Streets projects to make permanent safety improvements. These include 74 million for phase six of our Grand Concourse Great Streets project, adding bike lanes from 138th to 161st Streets. 12 million for the Southern Boulevard bus stops under the L Corridor project, including constructing a series of sidewalk extensions to enhance safety and accessibility un under the elevated train line. 19 million for the Jamaica Bay Greenway Marine Parkway connector to facilitate bicycle connections to the Marine Parkway Bridge. 13 million for Bayswater Park, enhanced pedestrian safety and access and to increase access to Bayswater Park and Far Rockaway. 9 million for the Masspeth Avenue and Rust Street Railroad crossing to enhance safety, accessibility and freight mobility at the Masspeth Rust Railroad crossing. 5 million for Willowbrook Road safety and accessibility enhancements, including new curbs and sidewalks. 10 million for Manhattan safe routes to schools to enhance safety around seven schools in Northern Manhattan. 7 million for Third Avenue neck downs to enhance pedestrian safety from 60th to 66th streets in Manhattan and 11 million for intersection improvements at Third Avenue and 138th Street in the Bronx. This budget also includes four head count and approximately 1.5 million a year to implement the dangerous vehicle abatement program, which we plan to launch in the fall, as well as 29 head count and 2.8 million in the baseline to establish the DOT crash investigation and analysis unit in response to the council's recent legislation. Bike boulevards and bridges for the people. Uh, with the funds in this budget, we will implement five new bike boulevards, streets that are designed to give bicycles travel priority and put cyclist safety first, including two headcount dedicated to this effort. We will also enhance pedestrian and cycling infrastructure on two iconic bridges. Beginning this fall, the left lane of the Manhattan-bound Brooklyn Bridge will be ready for use as a dedicated bike lane, and I should say early in the fall. Uh, and on the Queensboro Bridge, we will convert the north outer roadway to a two-way bike path and south outer roadway to a two-way pedestrian path with funds allocated in this budget, including funds provided by the Queensboro president. We also anticipate additional funds coming in the council members have committed to allocating and we appreciate your support and I wanna thank you. This budget also funds three additional staff for implementing the mayor's green wave plan for citywide protected bike lane network efforts as well as materials to replace damaged dividers. And it includes funds to install 10,000 new bike racks by the end of 2022, <coughs> providing 20,000 additional bike parking spaces citywide an expansion I announced with the mayor when I was appointed in February. This budget also makes much needed investments in the state of good repair of our 6,000 miles of city streets 
and 792 bridges and tunnels, including the historic East River crossings, a surface transportation network on which all New Yorkers rely for walking, biking, micro-mobility, buses, automobiles, and the movement of goods. On top of the 910 lane miles of resurfacing for this year, this budget builds on six straight years of record levels under the de Blasio administration by funding 1,150 miles per year for the next 10 years, including 50 miles of bike lanes. And this budget allocates more than 1 billion for pedestrian ramp upgrades over the next 10 years. This budget also includes 246 million for protective coating on the Williamsburg Bridge, 650 million for eight other oh. bridge structures across the city in need of repair and 81 million for 10 different oh, state of right. good repair. Good. Sorry. Should I continue or? Yes, please continue. Somebody is not on mute, so please mute yourselves, everybody. Okay, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank this budget course. also, in, uh, yes. 650 million for eight other bridge structures other than the Williamsburg Bridge, 81 million for 10, 10 different state of good repair street reconstruction projects across all five boroughs. We will also upgrade our markings management system and invest 78 million for several facilities needed to support our growing operations. Finally, when it comes to taking care of our infrastructure, with funding in this budget, we will install 10 way in motion or whim sensors at locations around the city. While getting state authority to use whim for automated enforcement on the BQE and other key points is needed urgently, it's not the only highway uh, on which weight and size limits are ignored. And many of our streets in, neighbor in residential neighborhoods are affected by overweight and oversized trucks as well many of which are using our local streets in violation of the law. These sensors will provide much needed data to better manage our infrastructure and develop comprehensive solutions for encouraging a culture of compliance. Conclusion, I would like to thank the council for the opportunity to testify before you today. I look forward to working with you in this final year of the de Blasio administration to create a recovery for all of us and to help this great city come back better than ever. I'm now happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, I appreciate you coming in and giving testimony. Let me start off with um, something that you mentioned in your testimony, which is the Open Streets program. I'm curious to know, uh, because I do have an Open Streets, probably one of the most successful in the city called 34th Avenue, Jackson Heights. Um, but we are very curious to know what you see as being permanent. We don't know quite yet what permanent means. Can you describe for us when the mayor made the announcement about per making open streets permanent, what did he mean? Is it going to be the same hours that we've had? Is it going to be something different? Can you describe your vision of what permanent means? Sure, first, first uh, Chair Drum, let me, let me congratulate you for the success of your open street on 34th. This, your, yours, yours is, is clearly one of, one of those we point to as a dramatic success of the program. So what it means for the program to be permanent is that this was not a one year pandemic response. It may have started that way, but the administration recognizes that, that uh, the program has been immensely popular in neighborhoods all around the city, and it's something that New Yorkers want to continue, and so it will continue. And that's, that's what permanent means. As to the details of hours, configuration, et cetera, um, our plan remains what it has been all along, which is to make that flexible to meet the needs of each neighborhood. Um, the, the, we have discovered and, uh, and I think this is a, a benefit of one of the pluses of the program, that different neighborhoods, different communities want different th things out of their open streets. And so what we've tried to design is a program which isn't one size fits all driven down from City Hall or from the DOT, but where we provide the resources so that each neighborhood can do what works for them and for them, their community. And obviously, 
yours yours is one of the great successes. So our 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 input there is don't change a thing unless you decide that there's something you'd like to improve, in which case we're happy to work with you to do it. Okay. That's really good to know. Thank you, Commissioner. And um, I know that you put four million into the budget for um, expenses regarding uh, in relation to open streets. What about um, capital? Is there anything in the budget for capital? Because we are looking for capital um, changes, um, you know, uh, on Thirty Fourth Avenue, but also for the other groups citywide. Sure. Um... Yeah, our plan is to. Our plan is to evaluate that. I mean, you're you're quite correct that there's that there's not a present allocation for capital. Um, our plan is to look at that on an ongoing basis, and again, get input from the local communities. If if for 34th Street there are perf there are capital improvements that you would like to see made on a permanent basis, we're happy to do that and happy to to take that into account and. Given the season, I would suggest this would be a good time to uh, to let us know let us know your wishes. Um, but the idea is we're providing the expense money and the capital we will take as it goes. Because again, in some communities, um, providing providing what we provide works fine. Uh, but but we're certainly open to making permanent capital improvements. We just again we we need the input from the communities. So okay. So, Commissioner, um, we've been having the um, the workshops, the forums. We've had five or six of them. I think yep. they're in the process of, um, you know, um, drawing all those conclusions together. And I hope that before we go to adoption, we can get an idea of what the capital needs are, uh, at least for some of the um, open streets. Sure, and I, uh, you know, we we I, I can promise you our full cooperation, and not just for Thirty Fourth Street, but for for everybody. I mean, anybody who who can advance those proposals at this point, we're happy to hear and happy to work with you. And I think we should get um, our Secretary of Transportation, um, Pete Buttigieg here to see a, a funny example of what can be done uh, with our existing streetscape. Anyway, we'll, we'll talk about that later, Commissioner. Uh, we, uh, we, we, we all look forward to the opportunity to show them what we're doing in New York and let them learn from it for the rest of the country. Um, Thank you. Thank you. All right, let me just talk a little bit about congestion pricing. Uh, yes, the sir. fiscal 2020 New York State Executive Budget um, authorized MTA to establish congest congestion tolling program in the city. Congestion pricing revenue was projected to cover 27% of the 2020 to 2024 MTA capital plan. However, the rollout of the program was significantly delayed under President Trump's administration. But now the Biden administration has said congestion pricing can move forward and authorize a less costly and time consuming uh, environmental assessment. Uh, with congestion pricing scheduled to move forward, what, what role is DOT playing in the rollout of the program? And is DOT working uh, with the state and the MTA to ensure a smooth start of the program? Um, the, the simple answer is yes. <laughs> um, there has been a dramatic there has been a dramatic change with the change of administration in terms of the uh, the willingness of the federal government to cooperate in in getting this program rolled out quickly and efficiently. I mean, we've been thrilled uh, with our interactions so far with with the DOT under its new leadership. Uh, I'm sorry, it's federal DOT. Yes. Uh, to be clear, well, you're pretty got, new too, but I, I, I am, <laughs> yes, I am even newer um, <laughs> uh, than the secretary. So uh, yes, so with the federal DOT, uh, you know, obviously we're very pleased with with uh, with the cooperative attitude that they're showing and their encouragement to get this proceeding uh, uh, at a prompt pace. And we are working very closely with with our partners at the MTA, which as you know, is the lead agency in the process and with our friends at the state DOT and all three are working together closely to get this done and get it implemented and to make sure that we get it right. So thank you for asking, it's a great question. And yes, we are working as closely as possible with, with our, our partners at all levels of government in this process. And I meant that in a complimentary way that you knew. So we, we're welcoming, we're welcoming. <laughs> thank you, I appreciate that, thank you. 
How will congestion pricing implementation affect DOT's budget, if at all? And does DOT expect to receive grant money for implementing um, the system on city infrastructure? I think the 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 answer is that there will be there may be depending on some of the details of implementation uh, some budgetary impact, but at this point, um, at this point, I don't think we have details to share on that part of it depend it really depends on what we need to do by way of implementation um let me let me ask uh, uh executive commissioner jaron if there's anything that he would want to add at this point thank you commissioner um i would just add that you're correct uh, details to be worked out obviously a lot of work on dot's part to implement the the equipment that will be needed uh, on the streets and 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 then so there's a funding that will be discussed um, with the MTA to make that possible um, and some other impacts but that that sounds right Commissioner thank you when do you think you're going to know that information at at the earliest I think later this year um, I mean these are we're, we're we're at earlier steps I mean it may not and it may not be till next year I mean there there are details that still need to be worked out. At the moment, we're, we're looking to get the program approved and to do what's required uh, from an environmental perspective and all of that. Um, uh, and at the same time, we're working on the details, but we don't have specifics of a budgetary nature at this point. So uh, oh, thank you. Uh, Commissioner, you mentioned um, the expansion of bike lanes and uh, the master plan. And can you elaborate a little bit further on that for us? Um, with an update on the status of the overall transportation master plan. Uh, sure. Well, as to the as to the master plan itself, uh, we are putting ourselves in position to do what we've been asked to do by the end of the year in terms of all of all of the process steps for implementation of the master plan. Um, we are on schedule to do what you have asked and assigned us to do by the end of the year. Um, as and that's to, the thirty mile. That's the thirty miles of protected bike lanes by twenty two, and fifty miles in the out years. The the. I mean, I think the implementation of that, I believe, starts next year. I may in be mistaken. 22. Right. In fiscal so, twenty two. Yes. So I mean, we are we are, at this point. Um, doing the engagement process, et cetera, that's called for to be done in this year. Um, uh, and certainly certainly in bike lanes, I think we will be there. And do you think the funding is sufficient uh, that we've, um, for, for, the, for this expansion? I think for what we need to do in this time frame, yes, I think we're fine. Okay, does the DOT plan on conducting outreach? Yes, you said that. Um, and that, that process has begun. Yes, um, we're going to be launching. About. We've let me let me provide some details. Mm -hmm. uh, we've briefed the speaker's office. We are starting outreach to the community boards and the borough boards. We're going to be launching an engagement portal later this month, uh, and we have the funding required to support the development of the master plan, meet the ongoing reporting requirements, and begin be building our internal agency capacity. So for all of those processes which are supposed to occur in this in this year, we are we are we believe funded and we're already underway. Okay, thank you. And um, how will DOT how will DOT ensure that the master plan projects and funding are equally uh, distributed among city neighborhoods? Well, we're I mean that's that is a key element of everything we're doing. Uh, we are trying to make sure that we I mean for all of our programs we try to make sure that we are dealing. Uh, with all the neighborhoods that need them or could benefit from them. And in particular, we're focusing on um, on those underserved communities. I mean, I think you will see that in our implementation of things like like the e-mobility in the uh, in the e-scooter pilot program that we just launched in the East Bronx. Um, the purpose there was to try and address the needs of an underserved community uh, that didn't didn't have city bike at this point. Um, so that that is that's one of the defining characteristics we hope of how we approach all these issues. And again, um, you know, if if members of the council, members of the public, 
um, uh, have areas that they think need something that we're not dealing with. Um, we are all ears. We've got five very competent borough commissioners who are in close touch with all their local elected officials and with all their community boards. Um, uh, Chair Rodriguez and I have been on a, a, a five borough tour where we've just hit borough three in his district. Uh, um, and uh, you know, we, are, we are making the rounds. We, we are intent on making sure that nobody gets left behind in this. That's, I think that's a key, key value of this uh, pursued by this administration and certainly our DOT is determined to do it too. Good, thank you. And um, uh, you mentioned city bikes. I'd yes. love to get city bikes a little further out in Queens beyond Long Island City. Uh, we've been looking for that for a while now in Jackson Heights and, and further east. Uh, so uh, since you asked, I had to tell you. Absolutely. Uh, Happy to pass that on. Okay. Uh, and street resurfacing. Uh, the DOT previously had a goal to repave 1,300 uh, lane miles annually, which, re which was reduced to 1,100 uh, lane miles per year in fiscal 20 and fiscal 21. This reduced paving level was acceptable in fiscal 21 because of a mild winter and reduction of traffic at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the preliminary budget, lane resurfacing was further reduced in fiscal 22 to 910 lane miles at a cost of 205 million, prompting the city council to request in our budget response to add and baseline 87.9 million to the fiscal 2022 executive budget to repave 1,300 uh, lane miles annually. However, funding for only 1,100 lanes was included. So um, is the resurfacing of the 1,100 lane miles adequate to meet the city's needs? The, uh, we were pleased that the baseline was improved. Um, I mean, that, that was good news after the austerity we'd been dealing with in the past. Um, could, we, could we do more? Could we use more? I mean, I think the answer is always yes. Um, uh, but let me tell you what we can do with, with the baseline of 1150. Um, it allows us to plan and invest in our workforce and to maintain a steady program for years to come. I mean, we're, we're counting on this going forward as a baseline. Um, we're also gonna be doing 50 linear miles of bike lane resurfacing with this funding. So it's not just, it's not just for motor vehicles, it's for bike lanes too. So we're excited to have the higher baseline that we've had in the past. Uh, and we look forward to continuing the conversation about what if anything more is necessary or useful for the future. That's certainly something we're happy to discuss. So do you have the staff to be able to repave the uh, 1,100 miles? I, I, think, I think Executive Commissioner Jaron would jump me if I, if I said yes and that wasn't true. So let me, let me throw that to him. Thank you, Commissioner. I, I am nodding my head. Uh, yes, uh, we, we, we have uh, this season brought back a, a number of seasonals to do this work. And in the coming years, we will have um, the headcount we need. Absolutely. We're fun, well, well funded and, and we'll, we're in good place here. Have you, yeah. have you noticed any um, additional damage to city roads because of last, last winter's harsh conditions? Well, we've certainly, we've certainly had uh, I'm not sure what the final count's going to be, um, but we've certainly had, because of the tough winter, a lot of repair work to do. Uh, we've got a lot of potholes to fill. In fiscal year 2020, I've got the statistics here. Uh, we filled 173, 5,531 potholes. Um, so far, we've repaired 137,677 potholes in fiscal year 21, and I'm sure we have a lot of work left to do. Um, and uh, in terms of in terms of personnel, you can make your own judgment. But on the opening day of our pothole of our pothole filling season, they had me out with a shovel 
shoveling asphalt to fill a pothole on the Lower East Side. So I think it's fair to say we've got an all hands on deck approach to uh, filling the potholes and repaving the streets. So there's always work to do, um, but we, we think we're in good shape and particularly compared particularly compared to the past and the austerity. So it's, um, we, we, are, we are pleased to have more resources this year and going forward than we've had in the past. It makes a big difference. Thanks, Commissioner. I think I saw you and a few other people uh, out filling potholes on that day. So yeah, uh, yeah much appreciated. All right, I'm uh, going to stop. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry, Commissioner. I didn't mean. To I was just going to say I was happy to help. I mean, it's yeah. Uh, the 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 best parts of the job are when I can get out of the get out of the office and go out and see where the real work's being done. So that was a real treat. Absolutely. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Council to call on members for questions and should um, uh, council member Rodriguez get here, then we'll uh, allow him to make an opening statement as well. Thanks. Thank you, Chair Drum. Uh, before I call on council members, uh, I've been informed that council member Holden is serving as a co-chair of transportation in Chair Rodriguez's absence. So we can go to questions from council member Holden. Uh, thank you. Um... Uh, I just uh, before I uh, have my uh, before I ask my questions, I want to because uh, Council Member Lander had his hand up in the previous hearing, so I want to call on him first. I'll defer to Council Member Lander for his questions. Okay, Council Member Lander, uh, you have you have five minutes, including uh, answers. Uh, the sergeant will let you know when your time is up. That's extremely gracious of you, uh, Acting Chair Holden, especially since I screwed up by asking my questions in the uh, earlier hearing. So I don't know that it should be rewarded with getting to go first in this one, but uh, but I'm very grateful and, and I'll, I'll be pretty brief here. So thank you very much. And I apologize, Chair Drum and others for jumping the gun before. Um, Commissioner, now it's very good to see you. Thank you for the good work in your short, uh, but promising tenure. It's good to see Director Ott as well with you today. Um, lots to like in this budget, um, as you outlined in your testimony, the funding for the master plan to stand up the crash investigation squad for those 10,000 bike racks and happy they're going to be done uh, in 2022 uh, and the startup of the dangerous vehicle abatement program. Um, I, a couple of quick questions. One, at the preliminary budget hearing, I asked you about the Parkside Avenue bike lane and I meant to follow up offline with you separately. Uh, but I just want to make sure we're taking a look at figuring out, can we make that wide enough and deal with the turning lane issue there at Parkside Avenue? Yes. I mean, the, the, uh, I'm sorry if this hasn't been communicated separately to you or your staff, but the answer is yes, we're fixing it and the installation is going to begin in August. Wonderful. All right. That's great news. So uh, let's, uh, let's follow up offline so we can see the, see the revised version, but thank you for telling me that is, is sure. Great. Um, second, I want to ask, it's, it's really good to hear about, uh, your, hear your dialogue with Chair Drum about working with communities on open streets. And I was encouraged to see the reference to the city cleanup core and the resources that DOT will have. The thing I wanted to ask about is I was a big fan of, I've big, been a big fan of the Neighborhood Plaza Partnership, which achieved those goals of putting resources into the hands of communities where you don't have a business improvement district or a big anchor partner so that the a neighborhood association or a, a civic group can have the resources to do exactly what you're talking about, to provide programming, to be a steward, to make sure the space is well cleaned and maintained. But we haven't, we haven't renewed that program. And so I just wonder, can you help me connect the dots between the, the, the ideas of the neighborhood plaza program and where we're going going forward. That role of neighborhood stewardship is so important. It's great where you know volunteers can do it, but where they can't, I don't think the answer is just have the city play the role or a, or a city organized core play the role, but to provide resources for community stewards to do it. And I just wanna make sure we're factoring that into our, our plans for our open streets and for our plazas as well. Sure, and, and I, I don't have, at my fingertips, the information concerning uh, the program you referenced, but the idea of tapping into the community resources and relying on community organizations, et cetera, uh, is key to what we're, what we're doing for open streets. I mean, that's, that's the idea. It may be a different format, but the same, the same input is what we're relying on in, in most districts. And the, 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 
the resources we provide and support um, obviously are available wherever needed, but but the focus there is on is mostly on the communities that don't have that kind of network set up where you don't have community associations set up that have the funding to do this themselves. In those instances, we we have resources to help them out. And that's that's the idea because again, we want this to be accessible to everybody. And our focus, you know, our focus all along on this has been on the identified 33 neighborhoods that suffered most in the pandemic and in general on any underserved communities that that needed. And and we tried to make that when we announced the when the mayor and I announced the decision to make the program permanent, um, uh, we made that clear and it's part of the registration process, et cetera, that if people need help, they can ask for it and we'll get it to them. Um, so thank you for that answer. I guess I really would urge you to talk to folks who uh, had the experience with the Neighborhood Plaza Partnership. That was a multi-year, you know, multi-million dollar DOT contract. They sure. got a lot right, but I think also there were some lessons learned from it. So it does not make sense to reinvent from, you know, from the ground up. Um, there was a lot about that program that supported community groups to do exactly the kind of stewardship that yeah. we are looking to do with open streets and that we still need in the neighborhood plazas. So let me just ask you to go ahead and talk to folks and see what lessons could be applied for contracting and, and um, adapting the toolkit. Um, sure. uh, I was going to ask you about the BQE, but my time is up, but that's longer than eight seconds. So I'll let somebody else ask that question. Thank you very much uh, to the chairs. Thank you. We've we've now been joined by Chair Rodriguez. Um, thank you. Yeah, so, so yeah, thank you, Commissioner. And, and thank you, Joan, the Chair of the Finance Committee. Uh, you know, it's been a great honor uh, to be a part of this committee. Uh, since elected in 2009, I was a member to 2013 and then being the chairman of this committee from 2013 to today, we have seen all the amazing work that we have done. It. We have seen how Vision Zero make a big change in the city of New York and nothing is perfect. We have a lot of work to do. We have to continue investing more on bus lane. Uh, we need to continue building more protected bike lane. We need to continue making our entry of the stations more accessible. But I feel that uh, uh, again, working with City Hall, with Major de Blasio, the team with the former chairman, Polly Chomber, and now with you, uh, Commissioner, in the whole team of DOT, it's a great honor. And we have seen how the investment from the city of New York, when it comes to uh, put the money, when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, where our need are, is important. Everyone know that if we continue the fiscal 2022 budget process. You know, it's a process that will lead to adoption of a budget that is progressive, responsible, and fair for all New Yorkers. But at the same time, the question will be, how can we also do better? And when we look at the number, we have seen the, how DOT financial outlook is very different than it was just a few months ago. And then on March 10, 2021, one day after the committee preliminary budget hearing, a President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan, which provides significant level of federal funding to New York City. I think that our challenge is always, can we spend those money in the time frame that we have it, it, by the, 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 the way of the description of the, of the federal uh, plan. In the American Rescue Plan, in addition to the Coronavirus Response and Release Supplements Appropriation Act, enacting in December 2020 will help the city to recover from the financial impact of the pandemic. And in addition, the state budget restore many budget cuts and cost shift imposed uh, uh, on the city on January 2020. And overall, this additional funding combined with federal tax revenue forecast and Jack Grove has allowed DOT budget to increase in the fiscal 2022 when we compare to last adopted budget. It, it, again, like the executive spent, uh, we have seen that, that the budget for fiscal 2022 is, you know, as the commissioner said, 1.2 billion. And in addition, 11 billion is budgeted for the department capital program. I think that we still have a lot to accomplish uh, in this in the time that this administration has left. Uh, by January 1st, I hope again that we can uh, make 
uh, uh, we can demand the administration should complete all those miles that we want, you know, 30 miles of protected bike lane uh, or both of or, or, uh, uh, or or both lane in our city and also to accomplish what we want to do with the with the bike lane. And, and I again uh, commissioner, thank you for everything that you're doing. It. And as you know, working close with uh, Speaker Corey Johnson and also having a great opportunity because he already put a vision for transportation uh, when he hold his state of, of the city a uh, few years ago. Now, the question is the challenges that we have because in this current administration, we have a few months. And I think that the administration should work to leave the standard on what the future administration should accomplish when the new one will take office uh, in January 1st next year. I think that, you know, you have seen how working with many colleagues, Borough President Gil, Borough President uh, Ruben Diaz uh, Jr. and the Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, we've been addressing the need to uh, spend more when it comes to a uh, bike lane. So what do you think will be your goal for the couple of months to complete the my protected, the, my, the numbers of miles of protected bike lane and bus lane in our city? That's my first question. Sure, and, and with respect to the, uh, the bike lanes, uh, Chair Rodriguez, uh, we are committed to hitting the 30 miles uh, this year as laid out in the green wave plan. And in terms of the more general point you made, um, as to what we can what we can do in this time frame, uh, I think this is an amazing period in which we can make some transformative changes in the city. And um, the mayor has already announced, and we are well on our way to implementing a whole series of plans that are designed to reimagine how people move, to reduce dependency on the car by making other alternatives like bikes, buses, e-mobility, et cetera, more attractive. And as we discussed last Wednesday on freight, we have added to that, trying to reimagine how things move in our city to reduce the dependence on oversized and polluting trucks. And those, vi those joint visions, uh, A, we can get a lot done. The administration's already gotten a lot done. And, and, and B, as you say, I think we can set in place a framework that's, that will, should guide the next administration in terms of the direction in which this city needs to move in order, in order for the recovery to be strong and work for everybody and in order for us to be prepared for the challenges that the rest of the 21st century bring, um, all of which you're quite familiar with. So, so it's an exciting time to get that done. And we look forward to meeting the various commitments the mayor's made. Um, we keep track... We have benchmarks. We keep track of them uh, on a on a regular basis to make sure we're not falling behind. And now we've added now we've added freight to the equation uh, because there's important work to do there too. All with the same aims of improving the quality of life, protecting our environment, economic justice, etc. Commissioner, uh, as you know, the ferry, the Starting Island ferry, is on the DOT. Yes. And I think that that's the approach on how we look at the ferry from the perspective of public transportation. However, the ferry, the other uh, uh, ferry had been on the EDC. I'm not going to put you in the spot because there's a bill that we have that uh, it, it will transfer the coordination of all the other ferry, which are not, I'm sorry, the water, water taxi. It, who are not uh, the starting on a ferry to transfer from EDC to DOT. Uh, I just want more than asking a question because I know at that level, you need to check also, you know, city hall uh, dynamic internal between agency. But definitely this is something that uh, there's a bill that we have uh, introduced that we have a hearing that I hope also that before the end of this administration, we can look at it to see how we transfer all the water taxi from a, a EDC to DOT. And most important, I would say, what I would like to ask you is, you know, to get time so that we can have conversation be, beyond this hearing on that possibility to explore 
with City Hall, EDC, and you guys, because I just think that the fact that the larger ferry, which is the Staten Island, is on the DOT, it means that we are looking at that as a public transportation for New Yorkers. When you look at the water taxi, it's, been, it's more like, you know, those who live in Long Island City, those who live in the part of Brooklyn, those are being called as gentrifiers in our city. So one of the uh, initiatives that we also have in the past, one is, again, just looking to continue conversation with you and City Hall uh, to talk about the bill that we transfer the, the jurisdiction of, of, of the water taxi from EDC to DOT. And the second piece is also uh, 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 from my own interest from the, for the island of Manhattan is that we also want to expand the, the water taxi uh, uh, along the whole island. So uh, there is, again, I know, I don't want, I'm, it's not for me to ask you, do you support a yes or no, but it's more to let you know that this is important that I hope to continue conversation with you in a sense of, you know, if we look at the island and the fair, if we have the water taxi, you know, going on up to 42nd, 72nd Street, a, a, a 96th Street, under the George Washington Bridge, 125th, under the George Washington Bridge, the diagram where we also allocated like close to $20 million to build a new pier and going out to Riverdale, then we can connect, you know, use the, of the, the resources of our water also to extend the, the opportunity for people, the option for people also to use our water, ta water taxes. So I just want to, want to ask you, uh, you know, this is something that you open to continue, yes, to have a conversation, to explore and to engage City Hall and EDC with those two items. So let, let, me, let me respond, uh, Chair Rodriguez, by saying that we are firm believers in making more use of our waterways. They were both for people and for freight. Um, they were, after all, the original highways of this city. Um, uh, so uh, the, the idea you raise is something that I, I definitely think is worth further discussion, and we'd be happy to engage with you and your colleagues on that subject. Okay, and, and, and my last part, I know that, you know, it, it, I apologize, you know, my delay big time, and I appreciate the chairman for starting, and I know that there's other colleagues that they also raise their hand to ask questions, so I'm going to be immediately letting our uh, uh, team to follow calling then, but before uh, moving forward with the new council member, my last part is about our trains, even though it's that's MTA, and we are now bringing NTA to this part of the budget. We already have NTA like two months ago, but I think that it, we, those in agency or, or the council, we know that the difference of the MTA on the DOT, but when you look about New Yorkers, the 8.6 New Yorkers, seven millions of them that they don't have car, that they don't have vehicle, that they rely on the public transportation. For them, it's about how safe are our train how accessible are the entry or the stations. So I also hope again that we will continue working together to uh, that those level of coordination between you guys and the MTA to be sure that we improve safety and also to make the entry of a station accessible in New York City. Uh, uh, and with that then, I'm gonna be just now letting our team to call the next council member that has question. Ha happy to cooperate on that. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm sorry. Play, and sorry, the summer play three. Uh, 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 this is something that I've been approached by many CBO that before COVID, they were uh, putting the application to use on the street, uh, especially close to the school, which they, they are on their DOT and they use as a summer play street. Uh, so far, there's no clarity. So far, when they have approached DOT, uh, there have not been any, you know, the summer is coming. Uh, this is the time on when uh, DOT should be able to go through the process of permit. And again, if you had an answer, great. And if not, then more than happy to follow with you and the team when it came on, what does it take for DOT to start working with a non-for-profit who have a, a history of requesting the street to use it for the summer play street? Sure. Uh Chair Rodriguez, if you could send me the details, I'll make sure that our team follows up and we deal with that. Okay. That shouldn't, that shouldn't be a problem. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Chair Rodriguez. Um, I will now call on Councilmember Holden, who had given, had yielded his time to Councilmember Lander, but let's uh, return to Councilmember Holden. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, just a, a couple of quick questions, and just a, I, I'd like to know about, uh, talk about Vision Zero a bit. The number of uh, New York City pedestrian fatalities is up 65% in the first four months of this year, from 26 at this point. <laughs> Uh, in 2020 to 43 uh, as of this week, according to data released on Tuesday by Transportation Alternatives. That's the highest death toll since Mayor de Blasio took office in 2014. The same year he introduced his signature Vision Zero effort um, with the goal of eliminating uh, all traffic deaths uh, by 2024. Um, so, you know, in, in this, um, uh, since Vision Zero, um, has DOT conducted a comprehensive study on, you know, cities uh, most dangerous intersections or just intersections that are heavily traveled? Um, and when was that? Uh, and if so, when was the study done? Uh, sure. Let me let me respond first. First, before getting to the specifics of the study, uh, we're we are painfully aware of the statistics to which you refer. And we are also painfully aware of the fact that these aren't just statistics or numbers, but that each one represents a human being, a life lost, a family, a family destroyed um, needlessly. And um, one of the things I hadn't appreciated in taking this job is that I now get an email every time there's a crash and a serious injury. So, you know, I, I am more aware of it than I used to be. By a wide margin, so um, and it's awful, and we we need to address it. As to your specific question about the geography, the locations of where these things happen, uh, we do follow that um, closely, and it there's not a single study of the most dangerous um, uh, intersections. Although I could certainly get for you information of some where statistically. It says they are, but but what we look for on an ongoing basis is is identifying the locations that uh, where these where these events occur, and looking at whether we could do something to help. Um, speed cameras, red light cameras, something in the in the structure of the road, uh, you know, and we we routinely make those kinds of adjustments when we see a place that shows up as, as the location um, for a fatal fatal or serious injury collision um, uh, more than once. But the, the um, I should say that, that what we're observing now um, is seems to be uh, a continuation of the conduct that we saw during the pandemic itself. When there was a huge increase, I mean, there are a lot of hit and runs in there, huge increase in reckless driving, uh, I mean, just reckless behavior uh, that, that results in, the, in these pedestrian deaths. And so I would, say, I would say that in addition to addressing the geography of the roads and traffic lights and cameras and all of that, I mean, enforcement's really a key here too. And we've been pushing as hard as we can, expanding electronic enforcement. Anything we can do from an enforcement nature, I think, helps. Now, um, we do have from 2019 the Pedestrian Safety Action Plan update, uh, which revisited the five borough pedestrian safety action plans that were published in 2015 using more recent data. So if it would be useful, we can certainly get that for you council member sure. but again but again we do look at this on an ongoing basis right right um before my time is up i just want to get in um, a question that relates to my district uh I had, I had a few other questions but now that chad rodriguez is is back um i could uh i could get on to my district a little bit um i i have um you know several streets that do they don't have curbs they they just um were forgotten in, in the uh, capital budgets over the years. And I have 
and most of those don't have sidewalks. So I'd say about a dozen streets, and some of them are main areas leading up to shopping areas where pedestrians have to walk in the street on a two-way street that's very narrow, and they don't have areas to walk. So lacking curbs and sidewalks, I've seen city streets be reconstructed several times over um, the years, while many streets in my district still go without curbs and sidewalks. And we're, we're in a good uh, uh, populated area of Queens, obviously. We're not in um, you know, some, some back area. So I've asked um, your predecessor when I came into office uh, three, over three and a half years ago that um, could we make a priority and start um, you know, reconstructing these, these uh, thoroughfares, give them sidewalks and, and curbs. And so far, nothing. So far, I've gotten nothing. Got not one street has has been put on the uh, agenda. Uh, I don't have a capital list uh, that oh, we're going to do this next year, the year after this, we'll do this street. I get nothing. Uh, I get no answers. Uh, and the same thing goes for getting a speed bump. I waited when I was campaigning in 2017 in the fall. I put in for speed bumps on certain streets, and um, I just got them finally a few months ago. Uh, it took almost four years to get speed bumps. So we need some kind of, um, we need some answers as to why things are taking so long uh, from curbs and sidewalks to basic stuff like that to speed bumps to try to slow traffic down. So if we're gonna address the deaths, we're gonna address the injuries, the, the accidents, we have to put on, we have to make a priorities list uh, and restore our streets, uh, Commissioner, to really, where the, the pedestrian has a chance, at least they have a sidewalk to walk on, or that we can slow traffic down without waiting four years for speed bumps. So I'd like to invite you out to my district to visit and show you some of the most, most dangerous areas of my district that we can talk about. But um, I, I wanna thank the chair for his indulgence on uh, you know, letting me go a little over. But uh, commissioner, I, the invite is, is open and I hope you'll take me up on it. Thank you. Uh I, I will accept on the spot, Commissioner Garcia, Borough Commissioner Garcia, and I will be there. Uh, she's got a very responsive and, and terrific team. Um, I've worked with them. We've 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 made a similar visit to one of your colleagues' districts. We're happy to do it with you, and uh, take a look at at what can be done. So, thank you. Invitation accepted. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. You're welcome. Council. Hey, Denny. Yes, yes, Mr. Yes, uh, Chair Rodriguez. Uh, uh, who are the Miss colleagues on? We're waiting for Council to announce. Okay. And thank you, uh, Chairman John, for what sure. you are. Thank you. I, I, I'm sorry we had to start, but you're my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Council, can you announce the next? Okay. Yeah, sorry, I, I had been muted. Um, next, we will hear from uh, Council Member Adams, followed by Council Member Brooks Powers. Yes, I'm sorry. And also, let me say we have been joined by Council Member Levin and Brooks uh, Powers, as indicated. Uh, thank you both for attending. Council Member Adams. Time starts. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Drum. Thank you, uh, Chair mm -hmm. Rodriguez, for this hearing. Commissioner, I don't think that we've met, so welcome. Uh, I represent the 28th District in Southeastern Queens, and I also remember Adrian Adams. Uh, I, I'd like to co-sign, before I ask my question, I'd like to co-sign on what my colleague, uh, Councilor Rolander, said ab about the um, Plaza program, which I thought in Jamaica a few years ago was very successful, partnering with the Greater Jamaica Development Corporation, where we did have uh, farmers markets coming in to the plaza. Uh, and selling fresh fruit, fruits and vegetables there uh, at Jamaica Plaza, right by the station. I thought it was wonderful. That said, uh, Commissioner, one of the very first pieces of legislation that I sponsored um, on my own was Local Law 53. And the bill required that at least two corners of a street intersection have the appropriate street name signage installed. 
I'm sure that you will agree this is a safety issue. Um, the bill was enacted uh, back in March of 2019, well before the pandemic. I, I just want to know, uh, we still have various uh, streets in Southeast Queens and beyond that have no street signage. Um, again, this law was enacted in, in uh, 2019. I'd like to know when the work began um to complete this work as far as correcting our street signage and when will it be completed the um i apologize council member if you've already provided this information to my colleagues but um have you shared with us the locations where they're missing or is this a general question for the city at large? It's a, it's a general question. It's a general question. Um, we'll have to get back. I, I will have to get back to you on that. Uh, this is this is something where I do not have uh, the information at my fingertips. If one of my colleagues um, does, this would be a good time to chime in. Um, but certainly we will look into it and we will report back to you. And again, if there are any specifics in your district that, that you want to, or elsewhere, that you want to bring to our attention, I'll make sure they pay, pay attention to it. We, we do recognize okay. there, sorry, uh, Council Member and Commissioner, we, we do recognize there are locations that need signage um, replacements. And, and so we, we please, if there are any specific locations that we can look at uh, immediately that are of concern, we, we will do that. Uh, th there is a backlog, I, I will tell you. Uh, it's a citywide issue. Um, and, and one that, that we're looking to address. Yeah, yeah, there's a backlog. That's why I enacted the legislation a couple of years ago because it was such a significant issue. Um, so, you know, it's a little disheartening to hear that we don't have any information available at all. And, um, you know, at this time, as soon as the information is available, I would like, you know, to know what the information is, how significant is the backlog. I'd like to know that as well. Um, and again, I'm sure that you'll agree this is a significant safety issue. New Yorkers need to know where they're going, where they are. You know, people from out of town need to know where they are. Um, you know, when they're driving around our city, I think it's uh, it's it's a little disgraceful that we don't have street signs. Um, I was in an area of Queens last year, year before last, uh, in uh, Chair Drum's district. Actually, I didn't know where I was, um, and I should have known. And I looked up. There's no street sign there. Um, so it's not even my district, but you're right. It's pervasive uh, throughout the city of York. So we really do need to do something about that. Um, I can tell you, like Council Member, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. we, we do have some contracting that we've just uh, started. We, we, can, we can provide an update um, on this soon. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to say that I'm very happy with um, the street resurfacing going on in Southeast Queens right now. Um, it's very needed and it's noticeable. So we're grateful for that. Um, but on the other side, I just like to note that the potholes are deeper um, and they're definitely uh, uh, causing some havoc on a lot of vehicles out there. Uh, so I uh, just wanna keep our minds on that as well. Um, with that, that will end my questions for now. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. We now have questions from Councilmember Brooks Powers. Time begins. So good afternoon and thank you, Commissioner Gutman, for your um, presentation. I just had a few questions that I wanted to um, put out there. The first one, I noticed that there was a significant reduction in installation of speed humps. This is something I continue to hear about a need for in my district, the 31st Council District in Southeast Queens and the Rockaways. And so wanting to know if the Department of Transportation is on um, track to meet its goal of 250 um, speed bumps for this year, but more so wanting to know um, how these requests are prioritized um, in terms of the communities across the city. Next, I wanted to also just echo the sentiments of Council Member Adams in terms of the street repaving. 
there are a number of streets in, um, especially in my district that have been identified that have not been repaved in over 20 years in some instances um, with the potholes deepening. And so I know oftentimes we talk about equity and resources and there are some communities that um, continue to be overlooked when these massive repaving projects are done. So I would um, really implore the Department of Transportation to look more towards um, identifying and working with our offices for these uh, streets that have not been paid, repaved in quite some time as well. We also have a significant tractor trailer um, parking dynamic in residential areas and especially being nearby JFK airport, wanting to know um, what the Department of Transportation can or has planned to do to address um, enforcement of this issue. The pilot programs that you spoke about, and I'm on, I only have two more questions. <laughs> I just want to give them to you all right now. Um, the pilot programs the Department of Transportation often do are, 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 are really good programs that I would love to see prioritized in outer boroughs, especially where there are significant transportation deserts. I find that in my district, we um, are often not a part of these pilot programs or, uh, you know, not included until it expands more. So I would love to work with um, your agency to ensure that my district is included in pilot programs going forward. And the last um, statement slash question um, pertains to Brookville Boulevard um, and the Rosedale community. It's a significant artery between Rosedale um, and the five towns and towards JFK airport. It is owned, um, by three different levels of government, state, federal, and city. But I just would like to have a commitment from Department of Transportation to working with the community and the local elected officials coming to the table to um, addressing uh, the concerns there. Um, I know it overlaps with a number of city agencies in terms of sanitation, parkland, um, as well as Department of Transportation, but wanting to work together to address the loitering um, and uh, dumping that's happening there. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, Council Member, and and I hope I have all the questions written down. But let me let me try. Start starting first with with speed bumps and response. Uh, in terms of the goal of 250 speed bumps, I mean one of the one of the issues is as we resurface, we have to reinstall speed bumps as well. So in terms of 250 new speed bumps. Uh, you know, we, we are behind, but we are furiously creating speed bumps, both new ones and as we resurface streets, reinstalling the old ones. So because of the amount of resurfacing being done, a lot of the speed bump work that's been done has been reinstalling them where they already were in the wake of, of the repaving, if that makes sense. Um, but if there, again, if there are any specifics Areas you think are unsafe, where you where, that you think should be priorities that we're not prioritizing, um, we're happy to hear from you. And and you know you can contact me. You can contact uh, Borough Commissioner Garcia, who's incredibly responsive, uh, and we will see what we can do about it. As to um, and and when I was out for the pothole blitz, I had the numbers in front of me. We've actually set records. The the Blasio administration has set records for repaving around the city. Um, so um, I think I think the miles to date would have, since people like to count in miles, would have gone from here to Los Angeles and back again and then back to Los Angeles. Um, so that's a lot of miles, but obviously we have more work to do on both the repaving and the speed bumps. As to truck enforcement, uh, that is a chronic problem that we are trying to figure out how to address. It obviously goes beyond just our agency, uh, but I've heard similar complaints from some of your colleagues and I've seen it in their districts when I've gone to visit. So um, truck enforcement in general is an issue that we need to address and we're working on it and we'll be working on it with our government partners um, in other agencies to see what we can do. And I believe that that addresses the, the Brookville Boulevard and Rosedale issue as well. But again, 
um, we're happy to sit down and talk to you and, and hear the issue and then, you know, to engage with our partners in government to try and provide a multi-department answer to the question. But I, I understand the concern and, you know, we should do what we can to deal with it, obviously. I hope I didn't miss any. Was there, was there a question I missed? Um, the only last question was about the pilot programs, but I would like to say I oh. have met with Queens Commissioner Garcia and looking forward to building a strong um, working relationship with um, her as well as your agency overall. But yes, the pilot program was the last one. Thank you. Yes, no, and absolutely. You know, our priority is is for, for any of these new programs is to address transportation deserts. So if, if you know, if we've missed something we're happy to happy to put it up next in the list that's that's what we're trying to do thank you chair drum there are no other questions at this time thank you very much and i guess we're going to end it here commissioner we appreciate you coming in and uh, giving some time i know that uh, the council we had some other questions but we will forward those to you in a letter uh, to answer and uh, as we move through the um, the uh, negotiations. I just want to know, uh, Chair Rodriguez, did you have any uh, wrap-up uh, statement or question? No, thank you, Chairman. And Commission, we're going to be following up, you know, we in, in how we still see some area uh, that we can do better on Vision Zero. Uh, but I will follow you things. So thank you. And thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Again, thank you to DOT. And uh, with that, this meeting is adjourned at, uh, excuse me, about 1.55 in the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.